Hello and welcome everybody to the Buy Round interview show. Today, we are joined by a very intriguing man. Now, we are a rugby league show, primarily. So I will introduce you as Roosters board member, Mark Burris. Hey, Jimmy, how you going, mate? I'm uh, going very well. Thank you for, for coming on. You look fantastic. Um, how are you going? Uh, I told you earlier, I don't feel fantastic because I've got a crack rib. <laughs> well, you morning. look it. <laughs> yeah, no, well, yeah, you know, it's like it's on the inside, it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. Yeah, I did a rib this morning, uh, rolling around and uh, letting ambition get in the way of ability, I think. Oh, well, you, um, you, well, like you say, you still look great and I don't think that's going to stop you in your pursuit um, of excellence in many aspects of life. Yeah, well, I've, I'm, I'm not letting anything fucking stop me, mate, because uh, are you let to swear on your show? Yes. Yeah, you no, can. I'm not letting anything get in the, stop me from doing anything, because, uh, like, it, one thing you get when you get to, I'm 67, one thing you get when you get to 67, you've got the right to um, do anything you want. And I don't mean that in a uh, reckless way, but you're entitled to try and continue to do everything that you want to do, and, and maybe even things you've never tried before. Okay. Um, I'll, I like that. With that um, attitude to life. Um, I mentioned that you are a, a Roosters board member. But to, to help paint the picture, I've got two questions to try and describe who you are. So when you're on a plane and you're coming back into Australia and you get your landing card, what do you put under occupation? That's a good question. Um, I normally put on their... Uh, sometimes I put on their self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> and other times I put down there CO, obviously he's in a company, company, CO director. And I just take the view that they can make their own minds up what that means. <laughs> what about if you go to the States and obviously they're a bit more inquisitive, they ask a, a fair few more questions. Yeah. What about there? You're speaking to the, you know, the, the, the customs officer. Yeah. Um, passing I usually say through. banking. I usually say banking. I say something about banking. I say, um, and I'm a mortgage banker, or because they have concepts over there like mortgage bankers as, as such, as opposed to Australia, we just have banking. So I usually say I'm a mortgage bank. In other words, I run a mortgage bank, and then they get that. Yeah, fair play. What about the classic question of, you know, you're in a lift with? This is probably stupid because people would say if you're in a lift with Mark Boris, you've got 30 seconds with him. With him, what do you say? Let's I don't know some. Very famous person. You get thirty seconds in an elevator with them. What? what a, how do you uh, describe yourself? Well, that did happen to me once, and uh, well, not once. It's happened to me many times, particularly when I was younger. And uh, uh, t- twenty years ago, I had to go to Amsterdam, and I had to go into the uh, head office of Australia, uh, the world's la- uh, sec- sixth largest bank at the time, whatever it was, something like that. Big bank called ABN Emro, Dutch bank, and I had to go and see the. Uh, I, I wanted to see the chairman. I was unannounced. I, he didn't. I didn't have a point, but I was actually. I needed to see him because I needed to do a deal with these guys about something. So the best way to do that, I thought, was to actually go there and just present myself. And after about two or three hours, eventually he came down to have to see what the hell it is I wanted, unannounced. And he said, "You got thirty seconds." And uh, literally said, "You got thirty seconds." And um, so I thought, "Wow, I better tell him what I'm here for." And I said, "Look, I run a company in Australia called Wizard Home Loans. I'm your biggest supplier of mortgages." And my partner is Kerry Packer. And I just dropped that straight on him. And I thought, well, that's my best card. That's the most important person I know in the whole world at the time. And um, fortunately for me, he knew who, who that was. He had no idea who Wizard Home Loans was. He didn't know what his bank did in Australia. Had no idea. Um, he didn't care whether I was the biggest supplier of it. But Kerry Packer and my association was someone um, who, whose reputation preceded him globally, but by the sounds of things at that time, uh, worked for me. So I probably best describe myself as somebody who lends money to people around Australia. And um, I have would also describe myself as someone who's been really lucky in his life to have associations with people who are far better than me at lots of different things who I've then learned from. So you'd look to leverage your position a little bit off the, off the back of that? I did when I was younger. Um, I was a lot more ruthless when I was younger, to be frank with you. But... We all got to leverage everything. I mean, you all got to leverage guests for content. You know, um, you know, footballers got to leverage the people in the club to see if they can try and put themselves in a better position on the day they retire. So they, you know, they might have ideas they want to pass by people. I, I think we all should leverage as much as we can where where we can in an appropriate way, respectful way. But now I'm older. Um, I don't tend to leverage. I just I tend to be the bloke who gets leveraged. So I tend to, and I like it. 
I like helping out because I did that. Yeah. So I take the view that I have a obligation to pay forward what I've experienced from others who are better than me. And that, that's a big deal for me. Help is not is a bit of a soft word, but pay forward is a better way of doing it. It's more, much more active. Yeah, so if there's a young Mark Boris out there, you know that there's many people like you that you can help out to be the best version of themselves. A good example is Connor Watson Lake, for example. Um, it's not just people who I consider to be the next Mark Boris or whatever the case may be, because anybody, I mean, anybody who I have an association with or even sometimes people I don't have an association with. Uh, but Connor, for example, text me, can I come and talk to you? Um, he's got a deal with... Um, Newcastle fullback, um, you know, they got this... Uh, oh, Kalen Pong. Ka- Kalen, who's got this coffee, cof- uh, cold drip coffee business. He said, can I come talk to you? And I said, yeah, mate, no worries. I saw, I saw Victor Adderley this morning. He said, can I come talk to you about something I'm looking at for post-footy? Yeah, so I feel obliged to help people when they ask me a question about business or mortgage business or property or buying real estate or... You know, you know, if someone's asked me about podcasting business, I mean, tied to a vaso, like uh, Bam Bam, he sent his team over to see my team when they were opening up their own podcasting studio out there at Penrith, and uh, happy to help because you know, like we've got to help each other. Yeah, do you, do you think with today's footballers, um, we see a lot? Bradley has his uh, his beer, Josh out of a car with his let's let's trot. Do you think not enough? take advantage of that position that they're in well at the roosters we encourage encourage this i mean like you know one of the things i remember having a discussion discussion with brandon smith um before he joined us um we took him to lunch and uh in the appropriate time you know i can't remember the time but we were allowed to at that stage and uh we said that's one of the advantages you can get in our organization you get direct access to board members and and whatever it is a board member can do for you they'll do for you just advice, help. Where should I buy a property? How do I get a home loan or mortgage or business advice? So the answer to that question is I don't think enough rugby league players, NRL players, um, are aware or in fact are given the green light to go and take access to those people in their organisation who can help them. They think the board members are untouchable, unapproachable, you know, something special. Well, mate, we, uh, as I said to many of them, you don't realise we think you guys are special. That's why we're always on the ball. We think you footballers are fantastic. We love going to the games. Well, that's why we're there. So you want to ask us for help, we're going to help you. Is this something that Roosters do with their younger players as well? Especially, you know, you get catapulted into this um, strange scenario. It's irregular. From other people their age, they get a lot of money. Everything looks like a great investment. They get people from externally come to them, buy this, buy that, start this, start that. Is that what sets the roosters apart? You think where you can go, look, guys, we're gonna we're gonna look after you now, contractually, financially, but we're gonna put some process or we're gonna put advice, not guarantees, but advice around we can build better people and better future selves. That's a hundred percent the case that is a it's actually systemized within the roosters it's not just random it's a systemized thing it starts with the coach so robbo knows how it all works robbo will have a uh, get together with the players say pre-season he might ask david ginger along who's retired from the board but ginger is the ex-boss of channel nine he'll talk about various things um i might go along to it as well or he might get um you can always get the you know to come along and talk about all the stuff that Nick knows. Um, just general advice. It is a part of our system, though, and it's part of the Roosters' way. And young players, we talk to their parents. It's, we, we, we say it to their parents, you know, like, uh, you know, we're happy to help out with their kids. And uh, this is our board. Look at our board members. And uh, we do that on purpose. That's a big part of our business. Can you take us just inside that boardroom? Um I guess a lot of viewers and listeners you know, all know and acknowledge that boards exist um, in sporting clubs throughout Australia and the world. But what exactly goes on in there? Does it ever get fiery? 
Um, no, like, not our board. Not your board. It's all cool, calm, collective. Uh, not cool, uh, not calm, but it never gets fiery because a good board has a good chairman and a good chairman controls his board or her board. So in our case, our chairman is Nick Politis, you know, whose reputation precedes him, you know, and everybody's got a different view on who Nick is, Uncle Nick and blah, 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 all those different stories about him. Um, you know, I've known him. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for a long, long time. Um and served, and I, I will say this happily, served under him as a board member. He runs our board. That's it. Nick talks to the media. We don't about the Roosters. Um, uh, Nick is, like for us, is the dude who runs the show. Now, we have our CEO, of course, but, we ha- but Nick is the main person there. So we're there to serve the chairman of the board and to serve our fans, to serve our members and our players. That's our audience. Not in that order, by the way. There's no particular order. Everyone has different demands at different times. And that's how every board member operates. So a typical board meeting goes for four or five hours. We do both Leagues Club and Football Club, so I'm on the board of both. Um, Leagues Club's a bit more business-orientated. We never talk about the... you know. Cash, you know, turnover, meals, all that sort of stuff, usual sort of stuff you'd expect. There's a lot of mandatory stuff there, but when it comes to the football club, which is the, from my point of view, is much more interesting because we're talking about footy, we get reports in from, you know, the CEO, um, the, the, the chief operating officer. They come and do proper reports. It's very formalized. It's every single month. Um, we have board papers given to us in, like, a prepared and well prepared because I'm on lots of different boards around the place and they're well prepared papers. We get in a, in enough time for us to read the papers. We go through every item and we vote on every item that needs to be voted on in a, in a constitutional sense. And uh, and it's a very well-managed, well-run business-style board. It's not us sitting there having beers or having a free meal. We don't get any of that. We don't have meals there. We don't have beers there. Rarely had a drink there. We will get a cup of tea or a coffee while we're sitting there. Um, and they might bring in a bloody biscuit or a cake or something. It's more, it's more Danish or something. That's, that's about it. We're there to give our time voluntarily to the club in the way that Politis wants to run that board. So why do we never hear negative headlines about the Roosters board? Like, do you ever look at other clubs and just... All the time. Shake your head like constantly, you know, board changeovers, fractions within the board, um, challenges to the board, you know, n- new running members, whatever it may be. Is it just the model that the roosters have, or is it the people? What is it that sets the roosters apart where you don't get these squabbles? Because you know what? Hearing you talk there, it was like it's a well oiled machine, but it almost sounds it's not. It's not entertaining. Like there's no fighting. No. Like, you know, the, some. I feel like some people just like to argue, in in other boards, or the maybe a little bit of self interest there, rather than serving the fans, the members, the players. Well, Jimmy, you know as well as I do. If you you're in an environment, and you see weakness. Like you're playing footy, and you smell weakness. You'll take advantage of weakness. There's no weakness from our chairman. He never shows any weakness. So even if you were thinking about doing something, you're not going to do it because you get crushed. It won't work. So there's no point in having those thoughts. Not, I've never had those thoughts because he's a friend, but and I'm there to support him as a friend. But he runs it. There is no weakness in our club. There's no cash weakness. We've got plenty of cash. Um, we've got plenty of assets. We've got... Great coach. There's no weakness in the coaching environment. We've got a great CFO and a great CEO. You know, and it wasn't always that way. We, it's That's been something that's been built over the last... Well, I've been there nearly 20 years, so it's been built over the last... More more, more likely the last 10 years. But right now, there is no weakness. That was not the case in the early 90s when Nick, before Nick became chairman. There was infighting. There was a lot of drama. And then that's how Nick actually became the chairman. Closed down the drama. There was a bit of a, a like a sort of board takeover type thing in the 90s. But since then, there has been no drama. 
And you've got to remember, like, on our board those days, um, straight off, when Nick took over, he had James Packer. You had, like, power sitting on the board. You know, David Gindrell, the boss of Channel 9 Group, you know, the broadcaster for the footy. Power. So over time, that's sort of been maintained in the environment. So it's not a place where you can create drama. But we did have some problems, like, um, a couple of years ago, we, we bought a bowling club and, you know, at Waverley, and we wanted to change around and change the bowling around. And we now had a... We had a bit of a, a stoush with some of the bowlers and stuff like that, and, and it was a bit embarrassing for us, to be honest with you. But, you know, we worked through it and did it logically and communicated, and I guess at the end of the day, it's just professional people sit on that board, people that are on other boards who are used to being doing this. We're not uh, looking for a cosy job or a, you know, a free meal or a trip overseas. No, none of us want any of that. Um, we get that we've had that a lot of us have had that in the past um, we're not looking for power none of us are trying to get a power base there's no power base for any of us the power resides in our chairman and probably a better way of saying it, the power resides in our club the club is the most important thing for all of us and for nick i mean nick could do anything he wants he's a multi-billionaire he is 80 odd years of age he doesn't have to do this he had to greece if he wanted to and live there and live wherever he wants he does it because he loves the club like truly loves a club and there's no power game for him he couldn't give a stuff about the power like it's, it's, he's just doing the right thing by the players and the club at every stage trying to build this club for a sustainable future for if you know we wanted to be there in a hundred years when we're all dead you know we might last nick might last five or ten years you know i might last another you know on the club you know another 10 years I'll be in my late seventies, and so like you know, we want to make sure that we pass something on for the the next generation and leave it in good shape. I was going to say it, it's passion, but it's not. It's passion and smarts, and knowledge, care. So I go back to what I asked you before. Like, what are your thoughts on some of these other big clubs and constantly in the headlines for infighting and board takeovers? If I can be completely selfish for a moment, um, I'm happy about it. Because if your club board is fighting or infighting or if there's um, uh, un uh, unstable board, it filters all the way down to the players. And the, the team does not perform. You can have the best team on paper, but if there's not a connection between the the board and the administration and the players, including the coach, then, but but all, but equally, where everybody knows their job, by the way, so the board can't interfere what the coach does and the coaching mob do. The coaching mob can't get in, involved in what the board does. The board can't be telling players what they shouldn't be shouldn't be doing. Shouldn't be contacting players. Hey, you know you you know whatever go, go and you know do this whatever. You know, they, it's it's got to be um, a proper segregation of duties, but at the same time, everybody working off the same song sheet, and no instability. There's got to be stability across the board, and trust, and therefore trust. You've got to, and they've got to trust that your interests are equal to theirs. Yeah. So there's no second guessing. Or what 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 are they up to? Up therefore, there? players go and do their job on the field. You know, they're not worried whether they're going to get cut. Or, you know, is something going wrong? Where can we not afford to pay the players? Or is uh, should I believe that director or that director? Or or, or is the uh, club coach going to get the arse? And we don't know about it. He's not being supported. And, you know, I don't want to say any particular names of any clubs, but we know the clubs that we're talking about. And Penrith's a good example why they're doing so well. They're a really stable environment now, you know, and they've, they've done a great job there. To some extent, Gus sort of set up the recruitment program and everything else coming through, you know, like in terms of development. But it's also at the top, it's very good too. It's very stable these days. If you remember, like five, six years ago, it wasn't. Mm. Melbourne's been pretty good too. You know, like Melbourne's been very good in that regard. Can you take us um, inside the boardroom, what it's like when you need to land a big recruit? I'm lo I'm thinking, bringing back Sonny Bill Williams, Cooper Cronk's, you know, last ditch move or last minute 
decision to to move to Sid- Sydney, which obviously sent the transfer market into overdrive. Everyone's thinking, how can we get him on? What what's it like inside that Roosters board when a big fish is available? You might be surprised to hear this, but you never really make decisions in the board meeting they're already made before the board meeting gets held. So if you're a good chairman, when you go into that board meeting and you want a big decision to be made, the decision's already made in each of the individual's minds. And then all it is is effectively ratified at the board meeting. So our chairman, along with our coach and other staff members, as opposed to board members, um, we'll have already done the deal. Then it just gets put to us for ratification. And it is explained, this is how we can afford it, this is the process, um, you know, you know we, our CFO is always doing, you know, like, like literally every month, every meeting, we have a meeting every month, literally every month is, you know, we get our salary cap stuff written out, I know everyone talks about the sombrero, but that's all bullshit, that, that's just a nice story that was created by Triple M, whoever it was. You know, like, but it's a nice story. But you know, like we got really strict rules. You know, and the, and the NRL is all over everybody, every club, by the way, these days especially, about d- doing any outside of the rules. So we we are then effectively told by our CFO that yes, this player can be we can afford it, this particular player, but we might have to trade one or two other players. It might mean we're moving someone out, moving someone in, um, and you know. We, or we might do a deal with the club that the individual comes from is getting still get a little bit from the club and we, we're topping it up. Yeah, we do all those. We, basically what we want to know at the board is, is that all safe? Is that okay? Because we don't want to get in trouble as a board. And But the individual who we're trying to recruit, the deal is usually done. And it's normally, to be honest with you, it's Nick and Robbo who come up with these brilliant moves. Like SBW, I mean, like, that's... That's Nick. I mean, he's always done that. I mean, and by, and by the way, you can go back to Roosters when Kerry was there. Kerry Packer, I know he's a South was a South supporter, but he was also a big Roosters supporter at one stage. He went and got Bobby Fulton. He got Bozo to come into our club, captain, coach, blah blah blah. We've always done that because we've had to because we've got a very small catchment. Most of the schools in our area play rugby union or soccer or not allowed to play any contact sport at all. You know. <laughs> uh, for all the reasons, and um, yeah, so we've got to go and get our marquee by it. We've got to go find them. Nick's good at finding a marquee, and you know, like it, it, the a lot of these guys, like Sonny Bill, Cooper Cronk, even Brandon Smith. Sometimes they come to us. They might have another choice going somewhere else for the same money, but they come to us because of who we are in the system. It's a good system. And I'm not saying it because I'm involved in it. It's a good system. Robbo's a fantastic coach, not just as a skill in a skill sense, but there's a lot of stuff around you. Like we look after people, and uh, you know, we've only just moved in our centre of excellence, excellence, like a couple of weeks ago. Before that, we were in a demountable, so we we didn't have the best equipment, we didn't have the best outfit for people to train. But there's a, a sort of a system that sits around everybody. And it starts, it starts with the coach, by the way. And we have someone like Kathy King. Like, Kath King's, like, everyone's mother. Or, our, you know, and all the boys, they love her. And she's been there forever. She looks after them, runs around for them. And if there's a problem, she, you know, she'll if you need a meal, if you've got COVID, if you're sick. Or, you know, Kath just looks after them like a mum. Or our academy. Like, we've just opened our academy um, a year and a half ago. And we've got young kids in there now. And we put them up, you know, building we are because you know we're lucky we've been able to make money and keep money none of us get paid and um, we put the kids in the academy so there's and then those kids you know we we cut them if they're crazy no good we have to we have a we have a zero zero tolerance rule like you're out if something you if you're no good if you're a troublemaker you're out sometimes we try we give everyone plenty of help you know like and you know that sometimes that role of looking after someone who might be a, a bit wild gets allocated to me. I remember originally Jared, when Jared came to us, Adam Manley. Um, he was a bit, you know, so they I was made his mentor. 
know, um, um, I also had um, Boyd Cordner, who was I was his mentor too, and I also was given um, Willis Mean, um, and because not everybody's, you know, they're young men. Sometimes they get a bit wild, you know. The job well, for it me. sort of comes with the territory, doesn't it? If you, you know, it's encouraged, Nelly. It is, and you kind of have to be that way almost to make it. You can't be wired up correctly because if you were, or a lot of the time, if you were, you there's take a fine one look at our sport and go, no, who would do that? Yeah, what? Can I do something else? Well, it's not even just this, when you see them on the paddock; it's when you're training. Oh, right? training's probably more hectic than the game to be honest with you like you know they, there's head injuries at training you know as well as i do there's blokes getting more concussions at training than there is it on the field i always found training harder to read so in a game i don't need to ask you how hard you're gonna go because i know you're gonna go your hardest or you know, there or thereabouts but in training you have some drills oh we're just gonna go at 70 percent well my 70 percent was probably about 50 then some of my teammates, their 70% was, well, it's a test match. And that's where accidents happen. And that's where it gets. Totally. Oh, I can just uh, I think of a few teammates and good friends, but they they didn't know what 70% was. They only knew 100. And it used to cause quite a bit of friction. Well, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic, that. Because um, I... If I could just sort of digress slightly about on, if you don't mind for a sec, is that the prefrontal cortex of your brain is the part that creates decision making and judgment about what's fifty percent, seventy percent, eighty percent, or and any other judgments you might need to make. Stop drinking. It's time to go home. Those sorts of judgments. Or yeah, and there's a lot whole judgment. And the the prefrontal cortex in a male doesn't fully form it's the last part of the brain to fully fully form it doesn't fully form until your early 20s and actually in actual fact i was speaking to a neuroscientist who told me that in polynesian um communities it doesn't form till even later there's a there's some science around this so the, the the ability to make proper judgments different to what you would make as a teenager you know teenagers don't make good judgments because the prefrontal cortex isn't isn't properly formed yet and those decision-making processes, often we have a crack at these young guys when they're 9 and 20 doing stupid shit, but it largely it's because they're not properly, uh, the word matured is a broad word to use, Developed. but they're not ready for it. And it wouldn't matter whether they're playing footy or not, they're just not ready for it. But to some extent that um, lack of fear is actually good for them. Now, I remember Sonny Bill Williams when he first started playing for the dogs when he was 19. He was shoulder charged. In those days, he was shoulder charged. He was shoulder charged and everybody, like, and uh, and getting injured too, by the way. Um, but now, but as he got older, when he fully formed, he, he, I, you could see the change in the way he played and the way he approached things. When he was young, everybody was said, he's one of those people you were talking about before, reckless, uh, hectic in their thought processes, uh sort of somebody you can't control and it wouldn't matter what you did or said to him he was always going to make maybe poor judgments in how we approach the game i'm going to flatten you when i see you get the ball i'm going to wait for you to run on your side and i'm just going to nail you with my shoulder as he matured brain wise he got much smarter about things much much smarter and you know didn't, and he got less injuries i mean he had a heap of injuries when he was 18 19 when he was first playing like and very controversial too if you, as you recall. So I don't, I, we look at our players like that. We say there's a difference between totally bad for the joint and someone who just makes some poor judgments. When they're just making poor judgments, we try to help them along. If they're just bad at our joint, you're out. There's, there's, that's zero tolerance. But if you're just making poor judgments, but then if you make poor judgments continually, that's a different circumstance again. And then we've got to put you in the freezer of a while. Yeah. Which we've done. Jake, friend, up to North Queensland or up to northern New South Wales. And then we got him a job. Um, and look where Jake turned out. Fantastic. I think 
there is a quite a clear distinction between a good shit and a bad shit. Totally. Like I was at school, I was a good shit. You know, I was a bit banter with the teachers and you know, they bit of a rat bag, but I'm not gonna cross that line. Thankfully, I had rugby league to guide me though as well. And it's interesting just just thinking along the way there where, you know, there's a lot of danger and risk to our sport and and whatnot, but I think it, it is good for society, especially those type of individuals that maybe without it would be would go from a way to channel their energy. So you you know, you talk about some people making bad decisions and the frontal cortex not being developed, but in the back of their mind, they know I can't mess this up because I lose my deal with the Roosters yep. and the opportunity to play NRL. But if that's not there, what other decisions do they then then make? And I think it's better for society that some of those individuals have got this avenue to go and express themselves, develop as people. And then when they hit their late 20s, early 30s, they're better formed people than had it not been for rugby league. And I don't think that message gets put across enough that society is better thanks to our sport. Well, that's what our club system precisely is our objective. That's what we try to achieve. That's what Robbo, I want to turn these young fellas into men. Now, we don't mean that in a a toxic male bullshit thing. You know, we're not talking about that type of thing. We're talking about helping them become the best version of themselves. What's best for them? And that is our system. And that's what we try to produce. You know, we're not trying to put us... We just, like, by the way, we didn't just jump off the cross either. Yeah. Any of us. But and we're not putting ourselves above anybody. But that's our game. That's what we try to do at, at, at the administration level. And try to help out, help them wherever we can. Um, and that goes right back to why I'm on the board of the Roosters because I actually want to help these young blokes. Um, yeah, they're good kids. I mean, I see a lot of myself in them, like maybe in terms of um, opportunity where I grew up and, you know, what I didn't get compared to what other people got and stuff like that. Like, so I see some of myself in them and uh, and I... I genuinely like helping them and I, you know I love rugby league like you know, I just love the game you know so I'd do anything for it you love the game you talk about where you grew up berries bulldogs they were called berries in those days yep what happened well I grew up in the Canterbury Bankstown district I grew up in Punchbowl um, I played Brett footy um, for the Canterbury Bankstown berries in those days um, I was in the uh, Robert Stone era I, I remember playing against him when he played for St George uh, and uh, I left home when I was 17 um, to go to university in Kensington. And uh, I was, I couldn't go to training. It's too far. I, d- I didn't have any money. Um, I was on a scholarship at university, but that wasn't enough money to really do anything. And, uh, and, uh, and to get to Can- to, to Belmore Oval where the training was, it, it was just too hard. So I stopped playing footy. A lot of my mates who I'm playing with, they end up they end up playing grade and etc. Um, and I sort of stopped following footy for a while. Um, I went and played second division for a while out here at university in second division, and but it was just a, it was a punch up every week, um, basically you know because a lot of the ex first graders went and played for Ride Eastwood and all those sort of clubs, and he's the bashing shit out of us young blokes. <laughs> it was just a punch up every week, basically, especially the Newdown blokes. Like the New, uh, anyone from Newdown listening. I mean, you blokes, when you turn 31, 30, you just beat the shit. I was 18, like, you know, like the guys were – in those days, no video camera. It was, mm. it was just all in brawl every week, basically. But uh, so I stopped playing – I played about two or three years, for, and then I stopped second division. And uh, so I stopped following, following footy because – not because I didn't love the game, but it was, I didn't have a television. The games weren't always televised. Usually, you know, footy – I'm going back 45 years, mate, like – 48 years, games were on radio. It was Frank Hyde. So, you know, you, you had to listen on radio. So I stopped following footy for a long time. Then the, and I was at this stage, I'm living in these suburbs since I was 17. Then the Super League war started. And um, I, I started following that and I didn't like it. And to be honest with you, like my mates at Canterbury, uh, like Graham Hughes, who was a good man. I played footy with Graham when I was at school. He's in my class. Um, heaps. And those, and along with uh, Bullfrog, Peter Moore, his uncle, they accepted the 
Super League deal. I didn't like it. What an happy. So I thought, well, I'm leaving these suburbs. I'm going to follow the Roosters because they didn't accept. They, they took on the war. I quite liked the fact there was a war on. It actually got me excited. And it was, I quite liked that it was Kerry Packer versus Rube Murdoch. It was pretty cool. And uh, I thought, well, I, I'm, going on, I'm going on the traditional side. I'm going with the tr- traditional clubs. And uh, Bruce got my support. Um, and uh, my dad still barracks for the Bulldogs, by the way. Um, but, you know, my family wasn't all that happy with me. Uh, and then I was friends with Gingell and Politis. And uh, in the late 90s, they just said, do you want to come and join the board? Um, at that stage, I was sponsoring New South Wales in the state of origin. I, I, so I took over the, uh, the wizard company I own, took over the sponsorship of New South Wales origin side in uh, 98. And I joined the Roost board, board slightly thereafter, um, maybe a year or two after that. Um, yeah, so it was uh, it was a uh, well, about three years after I joined the Roost board. But so yeah, I, I was always a Canterbury guy. My best buddies um, still Bulldog supporters, and uh, you know, give me shit about whenever we play Canterbury. And uh, but I, I'll be honest, here, Canterbury's not the club today that it was back in those days under Peter Moore. Do you, think, do you think he can get back there? Nah. I mean, there's just, he said it before, it looks like it's just too much infighting to me. It's a very wealthy club. A lot of money goes through the league's club. Um, and there's no one person who sort of controls the joint. I know, I thought George, the opponents, like he's, he's the ki- I love George. I think he's a king, you know, like, uh, but he, he found it difficult to control too. Like it's, I just, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to you, Jimmy, but to, to it, mate. I just, I, I, and I don't like it because if I was to, if I, if you asked me who's my second club, I would say the Bulldogs. I mean, I love Canterbury Banks because I love the West. I, I do love the West of Sydney, and uh, and I, I owe it a lot. I grew up there, and I had a, you know, I had a good life growing up there. I have lots of great friends, still out there, and and uh, so Canterbury's my second club, but. Some of the stuff I see at the board level, yeah, I wonder. And I don't know any of the board members in particular. I know some of them, but I don't know them in particular. But you just got to get this shit together and stop fighting. You've got a great catchment. It's not as if you don't have enough money. Like some of the clubs have got no money. They've got plenty of dough. The Lease Club has, I'm talking about. Um, it's a great area. You know, the old days, no one wanted to pay against Canterbury. Because Canterbury always took it up to you. The dogs, it didn't matter whether they were coming fifth last. You just knew that you had they, you, it was going to be a, a wrestle from the moment you got on the field. What you see is what you get. They would gave you get. heaps. I'm not sure if clubs think that anymore. We'll see this year anyway because they've got a great roster. Great roster. And Gus is there. So, you what? Know. Yeah, that's... We had had Willie Mason on the show. Um, I saw that a week ago, or a couple of weeks ago, and I think that's something he's he's trying to instill. Um, I'm back there myself as well, and you know we want to try and create an identity that you know you could say, oh, it's predictable, but it's you know what you're gonna get. Well, you know we Gus was at our club, the Roosters, for many years, as you know. Then he went out to Penrith. We're all in a pretty good shape. I mean, Gus is an unusual cat, you know. I mean, he's not normal. Um, Normal's boring, though, isn't it? Yeah, I, I th- but he just—it doesn't. You don't need boring out no. there. You need something radical, and Penrith did too. Mm. Uh, by the way, we did as well, you know. And uh, we won our first our grand final in two thousand two when Gus was there as the uh, director of coaching with Sticky, and they did unusual things. You know, Sticky came out with a gang tackle. That started in around that period, um, and Gus has just got this brain, this massive brain. You know, it doesn't work normal, okay? Normal hours especially, but it's got this massive brain, and uh, yeah, he just comes up with shit that uh, no one else does. So I reckon, with, like guys like yourself, like, and he likes to get stalwart old players who stalwarts into the joint. That works. I think you can see what. He and a few other people are trying to build there. That's what I'm excited about. It'll take a few years, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Rome wasn't built in a day. Hundred percent. 
and then, and he never promises like that beyond that. I mean, he's a he's pretty good at under promising and over delivery. By the way, the question will be: Will Bennett do? The, Bennett's the same type type of character. Will he do it to the Dolphins? I know our first games against the Dolphins up there um, in a couple of weeks. You know, if we have a full full schedule, full roster, we'll be hard to beat. But, um, but they got they, they got some good players there too. But he, he's going to he's going on embarking on the same journey. It's interesting watching those two old soldiers, you know, who've been through so much shit against each other, <laughs> with each other, like <laughs> how they go. Mm. Have no. they still got it? That's the question. Have they still got it? Like, uh, and that's a question that I reckon they ask themselves too. Have I still got it? That's why they do it. I mean, you know, Bennett's probably 70, he's in his 70s, Gus is in his 60s. That's, I know at 67, you ask yourself the question all the time, have I still got it? And that actually drives you. Mm. And uh, they want to do well. I think as well, when you, you've been so successful over such a sustained period of time, you know, they or people can't wait for you to fail. Oh, They're so excited for you to fail. That's and have a huge pile on at the end. It's like, well, and I think that's sometimes that, huge motivating factor it's like i'm not going to give you that opportunity to see me fail and but i will also say you're 100 percent right and uh you know i've been through that myself especially in the last couple of years um in my one of my businesses but equally people like me and i'm not putting myself in the same category but as gus and bennett but in maybe in my industry it might be um we're pretty smart at picking or taking on those roles where we think we can do it too. So, you know, would Gus take on Origin? Maybe not because he knows he might not win. But the fact that Gus has taken on the Bulldogs tells me that he thinks he can do it. The fact that Ben has taken on Dolphins, and not, not, it's not as if Ben is desperate or Gus, tells me that they think they can do it. So there's something they can see that you and I can't see. They can see something and they say, yeah, you know what, I reckon I can put this together. And because uh, I can tell you, you know, Phil Gould would not do what he's doing if he didn't think he was going to be successful. There's enough evidence there to suggest I can make this work. So that to me, it's a bet. I, I would back him on that. Mm. And Bennett, I would, I, but you know, not, it's not today, but down the track, I would say, given his track record, I record, record, because he can choose to do anything. He could pretty much do anything he want. If, if he chooses to land his, plant his feet at the Bulldogs, that should be really reassuring for all the Bulldogs fans because he's, he's done the due diligence. He's checked everything before he's taken the role on because he, he, he doesn't want his last legacy of being unsuccessful. He wants, him to, be, he wants to go out a winner. All right, and, you know, and if he's choosing blokes like you and Willie and, Barry and all the players have recruited and quietly in the background... I don't know. That's to me. That's a good sign. I said. I think as well. A certain type of personality they need that to make them feel alive. Like you know, Wayne Bennett. He, I, I personally haven't spent a you know a number of camps with him in the England international scene. I think he'll die on the job. Like he's not just going to retire and sail off into the retire and sail off into the sunset. He's just going to keep doing this. Why wouldn't you? Exactly. I mean, well, well. They can this. They can. There's a bit of a a falsehood there that everyone thinks oh, retirement is just s- sitting, relaxing, you know, by the pool and playing golf. You know, playing golf. It's that's this, you know, this falsehood really that you, just, you get bored pretty quick. And I've seen Wayne operate, and it's like he just he knows he needs it. He knows he ne- he needs that interest. He needs to be challenged. He ne- he needs to be you know, recruiting, coaching, teaching. Otherwise, you just, you don't sail off into the sunset. Well, if you do, when you hang your boots up or your gloves up, mate, that's nearly like saying, okay, I'm done. You're going under. And it's a, it, you don't go like that or go like that. You go like that. A sharp decline. Yeah, you do decline. Very sharp decline. And I reckon, th- and I think also, some, and it would not, it's not just these two, but these two individuals we're talking about right now, I think they're both intellects, high intellects, and uh, 
they need the intellectual stimulation. They need to exercise their brain on these conundrums that a player or a position presents and then how does that position fit in and that particular individual fit in with the whole group? Then how does my group beat that group? So there's a it's like a chess game for them, but it's a never-ending game. <laughs> It doesn't end up in checkmate. It just <laughs> keeps going on and on, and you're dealing with the board, and you're dealing with the media, and uh, and it's it's sort of gamesmanship to a large extent for both of those guys. The game of life. It's it's and it's perfect. It keeps them alive. Yeah, it does. It does. We're just going to segue slightly from from individuals, I think individual clubs as well, um, into the NRL and business. Um, Sport is very emotional. It's very tribal. I'd say that business is a little bit more structural. Um, what can sport learn from business and business learn from sport? And I'm thinking, you know, topically at the moment with the with the CBA. Right. Well, sport can learn from sports administrators. Administration of sport can learn from business that. It's a very good question. See, administration think that they're business people and that they think they're there to run the sport as administrators. When in fact, and then they get quite confused as to who their stakeholders are. And I think, and I'm not, by the way, I'm having a crack at the NRL here, uh, but they then go and recruit in that image. So they're continually recruiting people in the administration who are in the same image and therefore we just keep doing the same things that we've always done. You know, and you and I have talked about this, but, uh, you know, a good example could be uh, protocols around concussion. So we will just continually, we have a theme about concussion. What we'll do is we'll continue to recruit around that environment. Everybody and everything that we write and every narrative that we present and everything that uh, we start to believe in, it's around that one, it's about that where it started from, it's going to never change. One never develop, one never evolve. And that's, a, that's a, an area for sp rugby league in particular where they can learn from business people. Business, we are always predicting for the future. Always. Because nothing stays the same one thing we know in business is we cannot control the economy and all we can can do is control our response to what the eco economy presents so i'm in the home loan business um i can as long as my butt points at the ground i can say oh uh, let's write more business but if borrowers can't afford to buy or borrow money then i'm not going to write more business so what I've got to do is work out how to control everything else in me, around me that I can control, my expenses. Um, how do I get prepared for when that changes? So in like e um, economic recessions, if we go into recession this year in Australia, historically in Australia never lasts be, last beyond 15 months, 15, 16 months. You go for 12 to 15 months. So that tells me, okay, Mark, batten the hatches for 12 to 15 months. But also what I've got to do is prepare for the future when that changes, when everything comes back, everything normalises and we're back, we're back on and people borrow money and all that sort of stuff. And what are the indicators I've got to look at to tell me when that's going to happen and how um, and what have I got to do to um, strengthen my bench to be able to do that? So right now means I've got to get rid of some people perhaps to reduce my overhead so I can deal with the difference in cash flow for the time being. But equally... When I'm making that decision, I've got to make sure that I don't get rid of, I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. I've got to keep some people who are ready that I can rebuild on for when things come back to normal. So we, particularly where I fit in in my business and my senior management, we are always um, predicting the future. So we're making, but we make scientific predictions about the future. We base it on historical data. We base it on the current data. We look for variations. We build models. So I think that the NRL can be learned from business, get better, stop being emotional, um, stop doing everything, and, and don't be um, nervous about doing anything new and just do what we've always done. 
and start to predict what the future expectations of all the stakeholders are, TV audience, broadcasters, players, RLPA, players' representatives, etc., clubs, and start to build up a future prediction as to what the expectations are from everybody and then start to build your business around that. That's what I think sports administration can get from business owners, which is what our club does. That's what we do. We only have business people. We have Rico, who's an ex-player. We have to have an ex-player on the board and there's no better one than Rico. But but Rico's also a business person too. He's in business. So we're always trying to do that in our club. We have enough people in the club who can do footy stuff. We don't get involved in footy stuff. We just get people to just tell us what's going on. But we, we wouldn't ring up the coach and say, hey, mate, you know, you know, uh, Radley should be playing on the left side instead of the right side or shouldn't be sort of a, a second 5'8". Should be, you know, those conversations never happen at our club, ever, ever. We don't get asked and, we, and it's not offered for us to give an opinion. But we run our club in terms of finances and always being ready to take on a, the advantages of whatever might get presented to us in the future. So we run this predictive science thing. Business is very good at that. Where business is not very good, though, is at, at uh, things like loyalty, um, you know, all the soft skills that exist, and also understanding our customers' emotions. You know, we're not very good at that. We're good at knowing what people's ep expectations are in terms of return and product delivery, but we're not very good at understanding how people feel. And we probably could get, we as business owners, could get a lot better at that. And you know what? You know, I am had a reputation of being, many years ago, being a real hard ass. Like, uh, yeah, not very empathetic. You know, and that's how I got the job as you know, the host of The Apprentice, you're fired. I gave it away because I realised from my... Uh, I, I, one thing I realised was that from my sporting experience is you can't be that person, which is one of the reasons I stopped doing it. I stopped doing the show. Some, they brought a, an Englishman in, well, you know, the Englishman is coming to do the show now. And because I don't think it's very Australian, I don't think it's very good reputationally to be saying to people, you're fired. And to also take them through, you know, build this whole emotional thing where everyone's fighting each other and crying and screaming, all that sort of dramatics, you know, like that you see in reality. And I actually don't think it's a good thing to have and I don't think it's a good thing to have my own business now. So I have actually become much more empathetic towards my staff. I actually seek, I, I don't necessarily do it for everybody because there are a lot of staff, but I make our business make sure, and COVID taught me a lot of this too, but to find out how you're feeling. And it's not just about you can fuck off if you don't give me the numbers I want. Yeah, the first question shouldn't be, have you got that report? What's the numbers? It's, how you going? Yeah, how you going? And, and, and actually, it's funny you should say, because only two weeks ago, for 2023, one of the things I've been doing is actually getting all the groups, our business is broken up, into, the administration of a business is broken up, into, say, maybe 10 parts or 11 parts, I think it is. And uh, I get the heads of each group and then all the people. I'm taking everyone out to lunch and saying, G'day, hey, you, what's your name? What do you do in that department? Because I've got 160 odd people in that part of my business. And I just to find out what they're doing, what their name is and how they feel. And do you like coming to work three days a week and staying working from home two days a week? And what do you think about it? Why is it better? Instead of me just saying, you know, my, my normal response is, oh, fuck that. You know, get into the office. I'm paying rent, a million bucks here in rent. Uh, turn up. I just spend a million dollars doing it up. Come to work five days a week. Well, what I found out is actually the people who, most of our staff live a long way out. It can be an hour and a half to get into work, an hour and a half to get home from work, which is inefficient, a waste of time. They're standing up. They can't do any work. Um, they're leaving home at 5 o'clock and 5.30 in the morning. They're happy and I'm getting a better outcome because they do the work. You know, we've got systems that can see whether they're doing the work or not. They're not all chuffing off and going to the beach and stuff like that. A lot of the people with me are, come from other countries. They're very diligent, hardworking, really appreciate having a job. And, um, yeah, and I've had to become much more empathetic towards staff and customers. And that's been a good exercise for me. And I've got a better business as a result of it, much better business as a result of that. Maybe some advice to them um, if they're taking an hour and a half to get to work. Maybe just throw on an, throw on an episode of the buy round. I'll make the time fly. 
<laughs> well, the problem is, Jimmy, they, they, they can't they, – they, I've actually said, why don't you do some work or read or whatever, do it, listen to podcasts and that sort of stuff. And um, a lot of times they stand up on the train. You can't even you – know, stand there like shoulder to shoulder yeah. with 20 people. It must be a punish. It must be tough. Like, I, I would hate that. Um, and I can understand it. And that's, but they spend some time with the kids. Yeah. I used to think, oh, they're taking the kids to school, you know. Hang on, well, it, so what? That's nice. They feel better about it. The kids are happy. They, as long as they do the work. You know, I, I went to um, Google offices in Sydney a couple of months ago. And the way that that office is set up is mind-blowing. It's like, cool, yeah. It is just, like, but it's not just on a whim. They've had um, like experts come in on productivity, neuros. Like you know, how, you know, how can we Psychologist. can we set the environment to raise productivity? Like, what can we do? And it is designed like perfectly. When the hours the kitchens are open, what food is available? Like the breakout rooms. It like doesn't resemble anything that like an office environment that I stereotypically used to think an office environment would look like. Yeah, the, the, I've done some stuff within for Google and uh, everything is built on optimization. That's, yeah. It's about getting the most out of someone without putting in a position where they're only going to last three months because you basically exhaust them. So it's about longevity and getting the most but based on, on longevity. So you're a good operator, you're good for my business, I want to get as much out of you as I can for the money I pay you, but at the same time, I don't want to break you down. So how do I get a couple of years out of you where you're okay with that? You're optimizing yourself, you know, working going, fuck, I hate this, I've, they squeeze too much out of me, I want to get out of here. Because every time you recruit a, p a person, it costs you money, it takes you, you lose, you lose investment when someone leaves. It costs you money to recruit someone, and then it takes you time to put him into the role that you're recruiting for because they're going to learn the ropes. They're going to learn where they fit in. You know, where do I sit and have lunch? All that shit. So your your main game in business is to retain good people for as long as you can. And that's not about old school where you're the boss and you know you, I tell you what to do these days. It's about people. People got choices about optimization. That's the key. How to optimize, and you need scientists to tell you this stuff. Yeah, science is a big game now. Like if you go to Macquarie Bank and those places, down they've got whole sections of PhD engineers and scientists working there. And they're a financial services business, but they've got engineers working in there, working out scientifically what's best for customers, what's best for staff, what's best for HR, etc. And we're not at that level because we're not as big as Macquarie, but we do take it pretty seriously. So, you know, going back to your question, business can show the NRL a lot of stuff um, around how to run a, a business, which is the NRL. Is that's their bit? That's that's the game. The game they're in business. But equally, we we can also learn. We don't want to be too scientific. We can also learn about how to still maintain relationships. Yeah, yeah relationships is is what sport is built on, is now. I think totally. Um, you spoke about you know making predictions, looking at forecasting the future. What strategy does the NRL need to do to ensure its growth? So, you know, obviously the la uh, when COVID happened, I think the finances were on the table, assets were on the table. It wasn't looking too pretty to where most people thought it should be. What do you feel is the best? way oh, forward that's a really good question i think one of the things the nrl must do is make sure that it at the end of every year whatever money it makes it banks it now i know that sounds a bit obvious but instead of putting it all back into the game so if you've got excess funding at the end of the year i think they're not a public service they're not a public utility I think they need to build up a, a balance sheet so that if events occur, like you just said, like COVID, where, or if anything happens, we don't, are, are unable to 
renew broadcast contracts at the same money we've renewed in the past. The NRL's got to have a cachet of retained earnings that will see them through. So I think that's that's a critical piece for me. Um, I also think that the NRL, our game, every every game is about recruitment. We've got to be able to recruit players. The recruitment doesn't start at 17, 18, or, in the, or it, doesn't, it doesn't start at Jersey Fleet. It starts at under sixes. And we've got to win the game between ahead of AFL, soccer, and rugby union. I think we'll get rugby union, no problem. Um, I don't really I, at, the, at the moment... Eddie Jones. You're right. However, you, you, we don't want to let them make up any ground or go easy on them. Because well, and Jones is smart too, and he, yeah. he's going to play that game. He's going to start from the bottom. Yeah. He's, he, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a full gold. And, you know, like you and I have discussed this before. And there's a lot of money in rugby union as well, especially, and it's the global reach that it has. And, they'll, and Jones is smart. And he'll come and start, he'll pick a few names out. He'll, he'll, he'll knock a few rugby league players off no matter what. He'll do it. Maybe not for the World Cup, but he will over time. And he's good at playing the media and all that sort of stuff. I mean, he's, that, that's one of the reasons I got him, I guess. But we can't underestimate where we stay, stand relative to them because we must recruit great talent into – because that's, that's the imagery. That's yeah, the best athlete. Oh, we talk, we're talking like young athletes. Yeah, and from the get young the age. best athletes from a very young age into our system. Fall in love with the game, and be there to entertain us and surprise us and um, make us feel good and 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 make me want to go to the game and or turn the TV on, which is, means the broadcaster is happy to pay pay for that. Right? It's a bit of a ecosystem, but that starts in the under sixes. By the way, it starts with how do we talk to the parents? So. I got a grandson. My son love my son loves rugby league. He wants his boy, who's now five, to play rugby league. But you have got to convince his mum, my daughter in law, and she's she comes from a family of non footy players. So how do I do that? How do I? I got to first convince her that grandson's not going to get injured. Everyone's you know they don't think like you and me about like this stuff. Like when we were kids, we we just go and play. You know, whatever. It was the only thing we had. It was no, we had no choices. Now they got choices. So how do we make the game safe, but without ruining the game? You know, and this goes right back to the big conversation about concussion. You know, like not about not not about CTE. Forget about that. Just concussion. Just not dementia when you turn sixty. Any concussion. If my grandson falls off the lounge and hits his head, I don't like that either. So any form of concussion, how do I appeal to parents in a broad sense? Because my competitors, the AFL and the rugby union, are changing their rules. In soccer, there is no concussion, or there's rarely concussion, except they, unless you're doing a header. Yeah. But it's less likely. And rugby league's reputation is all about concussion. It's, unfortunately, there's a big reputation piece in there because our competitors, AFL and with, are pushing that narrative. So I think... We must, in order to make our game really attractive, we've got to have the inventory. In order to get the inventory, it starts when they're six. We've got to work the formula out. There's an algorithm here somewhere. What's appropriate without changing the nature of the game that sets us apart from the other three games that we compete with? So it's complex, complex and complicated. It is. It's not an easy one. It's incredibly complex. I was actually listening to um, a, a podcast called The Real Science in Sport, and they were talking about the lowering of the height of the tackle in English rugby union. And then there's other countries that have gone waist and below. Some have gone sternum. Why they've done that. And it's really interesting to hear. Like, really interesting. And that part of the conversation is the attraction of youth. And, and we attract. need the conversation, Jimmy. Yeah, we, d we do need to have the conversation. It's not a debate. It's a conversation. It's a conversation. And, and it's not going to get solved this year or next year, but the conversation's got to commence. I mean, that, uh, just, just on the on the how high to tackle, right? Sure, if you, you know, tackling lower means it's less likely that you're going to hit someone in the head with your shoulder or an arm or something. It's going to happen, but it's less likely. 
But I was talking to a guy who's a, you know, he's a, a, a well-known wrestling coach, jiu-jitsu coach, judo coach, etc. And he's been around a long time. He's an MMA, ex-MMA fighter himself, but and quite a famous one. And he said to me, we teach fighters that if they're going in to ta- do a takedown, that they put their head on your chest. They aim, f- they aim for your chest. Because if I tell you to go and take me down, I mean, occasionally you might do a takedown around the hips, but the, the centre of gravity around the hips is quite powerful. And if your head's there and I flick my hip into you, I'm going to knock you out. You, the tackler, is going to get knocked out. Where the lower, when you're, when we're saying, let's, which rugby union does now, you can't tackle above the nipple. What they're trying to do is avoid the tackler from knocking out the defender, uh, the the run, the ball runner. But also, the defender gets knocked out quite often. We saw we saw Rads get knocked out last year like that. We saw um, the South back rower get knocked out. Just bad da- tackling. By tackling low. Bad tackling technique. Then they hit someone around the hip. Yeah. Because their head was in the wrong spot. I've I've seen uh, 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 a couple of our Roosters players get get badly injured. I mean, I, I saw Boyd in Origin get hit, hit by a hip, and that was his last game yeah. ever. They actually, in this podcast I was listening to, they break this down around. They they put it into three zones. So they've got like what they call like the red zone. Yep. Fewer tackles happen at this height. Or, or sorry, this height, and that's a real dangerous zone for the ball carrier. Way more tackles, like here's the amber zone, and then, oh, sorry, there's the green zone, and then there's the amber zone. But because l- more tackles happen around the hip, we see the knockouts more often. Uh, on the tackler? On the tackler. But that tackle is more frequent, where the tackle up here is less frequent. So they... The analogy they use, which I found, which is sort of stayed with me, and I find really interesting because I was of the same thought. I was like, we can't tackle too low. Too many tacklers will get knocked out. And they said, because of the frequency of the tackle in this area, it's way more common. Like 90% of tackles would um, occur at this area. And like less, some, I'm ma- and these numbers I'm making up at the top of my head, and a few happen at this area. They'd say it would it would be like concluding that if you drove around Sydney, you'd see way more car accidents than you would motorcycle accidents, and concluding that motorcycles are safer than cars. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So. It's important that we have these conversations because I, 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 I agree with what you're saying, the danger of tackling there. And I, I thought the same. I was like, you can't do that because I got knocked out tackling going too low. But it's the fact that the frequency of the lower tackle is higher, which makes it look like yet yeah, more knockouts happen like that because that tackle... As a percentage that, that, of the total yeah, tackles. As a percentage of the total tackles. So it's important that we listen to these people and like have these conversations around how we set up our game in order for the best possible outcomes because I don't think you I don't think it's a zero sum game. I don't think you can have rugby league, rugby union, AFL, soccer with zero concussions. Yeah, we're going to try our very best to get there, but how can we set up the rules? What what situations happen that lead to more concussions and more head trauma? Let's try our very best to minimize, minimize them. So in American football, that is a bit of an easier game because it is such a stop, start, natured sport. So you can take certain situations t- completely out of the game. But with games like rugby, AFL, league, footy, they continuously flow. So it's unpredictable nature. So it's really it's it's very difficult for the games administrators to stop and con- control. Like I, I always think, you know, one of I, I th- I'd need I'd not done a study on this or looked at the numbers, but I imagine the highest collision or the biggest collision generating G the highest number of G force would happen off a kickoff. Yeah, when you're running full when you're running full tilt. Imagine kicking off to Big Jared or Big Nelson. <laughs> like no thanks. What's going to happen? Does the conc- the possibility of concussion increase or decrease compared to a regular run from one of those guys? I would say it increases. So then, therefore, 
Does the game eliminate the kickoff restart? And I and you look at and why you need a conversation on this stuff is because it's very complex and someone I'm sure someone can build some sort of algorithm around it because fatigue plays an important yep. part of all this. So the more fatigued I get, the the faster the game, the more fatigued I get, and if I'm smaller, for example, um, I'm more and if I'm and if so I can't and I can't tackle up. I can't take a big guy up high, but a big guy is going to run at me like. Um, you know, I'm Sammy Walker and, uh, you know, the big back row is going to keep running at me every time. I, I've got to work out a way to successfully tackle that particular individual. And if I'm getting fatigued, I'll, I'll do something silly. I won't. My technique will change. Yeah. So, you know, the NRL has got to work out. And over time they can work this out. How important is the speed of the game in terms of making it more attractive? How important is the speed of the game, therefore fatigue, how important is that to us? Do we need to trade that back a little, dial that back a little bit and maybe have a little less fatigue, a little less speed, which makes the game a little less attractive, but at the same time not putting players in as much danger as they're getting put into? Or do we bring back a bigger bench? You know, like well, well, a byproduct of less fatigue means the players get bigger as well. Yep. So then you could argue... That those smaller guys have to tackle even bigger guys, but the smaller guys might get bigger too. But I, uh, well, it, yeah, there's a, there's some sort I of am, well, I imagine though a guy like Sam Walker is trying his best to put on weight. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's ringing you know, weight eighty five kilos. Yeah, so if you change the rules to allow, you know, less fatigue, those bigger impact play, the the already big impact players become larger. Sam Walker doesn't get any larger. So it's such a fine balance, and there, like, I think people just want this silver bullet. There isn't one. There isn't one at all. It doesn't exist, and there, unfortunately, there's going to be some consequences for playing this game. There's also going to be some consequences, like I spoke about some of those lovable rogues, the good shits, for not playing the game. That you pay a price in life for everything you do. Or that you don't do. I can only speak for myself, but I'm very thankful and grateful that I had the sport of rugby league when I was an impressionable teenager. It's given me a great life, and I would never, ever change that. I'm really passionate about this space, as I know that you are as well, but we're not. I'm not here to sensationalize and be, oh, you've got to stop the game or do anything like that. How no. can we make it safer? What's real? Like, what is realistic? Yeah, no, how, how do we make it right? Like, it, to me, it's like balance, balancing everything out. Like... How do we continue to be attractive to parents to put the kids in the game, but at the same time don't change the game from a, from a, our viewers' expectations? How do we do we slow the game down or do we speed the game up? Do we? Ha, ha, it's a a wait a game of waiting. So we've got to say what these are all the variables. This is the weight that we all agree on that we'll attach to the various variables. Um, and in, and the players got to have a say in this too, by the way. Like to, for me, yeah, because the very people that we're trying or. Are we are supposed to be trying to protect. Yeah, totally. Sometimes they don't want it. No, they like don't. They, 100%. They, and, and also we need, like, so go back to that, the English Rugby Union announcing that, I think basically from the second grade below, all tackle height will be from the waist down. They've apologised already for how they messaged it. Yeah, because it people weren't consulted. And I sort of, the a couple of years ago at the Magic Round, there was this, I didn't, I didn't call it a crackdown, it was a new implementation on how the rules of the game, how the game would be policed in terms of any contact with the head. Now, I'm fine with that. But the, the message clearly wasn't delivered well enough to the players, to the fans, to the people in the media, to the coaches, because we could see the shock of the players. Like, what do you mean? I'm being simbin for that? Like, coaches... Press conferences were a state of confusion. People in the commentary box, you know, this didn't happen last week, but now it is. So I thought it was a really good initiative. It only lasted for two weeks, but the way the message was delivered, I think was very poor. That that was my issue with it. Not that the game's gone soft or I want to see that tackle continue on. It's so important how we deliver this message and the RFU have apologised but how they delivered the message because you had ex players, current players go, Oh, this is wrong because X, Y, Z. Well, if you actually present the message properly, explain all these potential outcomes, hypothetical situations, what we're going to do, people are more inclined to accept change because change is 
change is scary for most people. Yeah, totally. Really scary. The unknown. Like, what is my style of play going to be affected by this? Is my teammate's style of play going to be affected by this? I don't know. You know, the fan watching the game, well, what's the product going to be like? I don't want to watch 11 on 10. Yeah, totally. Why are we changing it? Well, you didn't know. But if we all, we, we all need to come along on this journey. It's not about a dictatorship. It's about bringing everybody with us as far as I'm concerned. And that's an example of where football, sport administration can learn from business. You've got to communicate to the marketplace and you've got to, and you've got to do it ahead of time. And we have a thing in business called a continuous disclosure requirement. You are continually disclosing to the market what you think the market should know, or what the, you know, what they need to know, what's important, what's material, and things like that are material. And, I, and I, I, I'd also say to just around the, the, the tackling style, or you know, or that that complex, you know, where you tackle, how high you tackle, etc. I, I, I would also say around that, I, just take. Take CTE and dementia and all that stuff. Just take it away. Take it off the table. It's it's, it's not helpful. I think this, is, this should be just about concussion. Let's try and avoid concussion or try and minimise concussion. Whether or not it causes other things in the future, that's too debatable. And you're going to get one side of the medical industry say it's, there's no proof then you're going to get another side of the medical uh, profession say there is proof and all of a sudden you get these elites arguing the toss at a, at a footy level and it's not important to us what's important to us is we don't want anyone to get a concussion i don't want my grandson getting concussion falling off the chair um i i don't want an old woman who's walking around with a walking stick tripping over and hitting head on the footpath either because the footpath's not probably looked up and getting a concussion either. I don't want anyone to get a concussion. Yeah, well, the best concussion is the one that doesn't happen. Correct. So let's, and, and let's identify what concussion is too. It's not just getting knocked out. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big one. Well, Some knowledge and education to the, a lot of these stakeholders as well would go a long way. That's, that's my, I think that's an important thing to answer your question. That's something I think the NRL can do for the future is be clear. What are we talking about when it comes to concussion? Let's uh, divorce concussion from things that happen to other people when they turn 60 or in the 70s or whatever it is, sad as it is, because there's not, not enough science around to say yes or no and let the science make that decision for us. But right now we're interested in players not getting concussed as much, but accepting that there will be concussions. We're not trying to say mm -hmm. no contact. Was, and I don't want to change the game. I don't want anyone to think, I, I love this game because it's a tough game. That's what I love about it. it it's, it's what life's like. I think one simple way that would see a huge reduction in concussion, and you touched on it earlier, and I know they do this in the NFL over in America, is limit and police the amount of contact in training. Yeah. And report on concussions. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know the stakeholder that would be most against that, which is the coaches, but they have to come on this journey with us. Totally. And they have to be they have to be in on it as well. Can't be having closet underground sessions. Well, you didn't really get you didn't really get a concussion. Like, you know, like a training. Yeah, yeah, you know, he'd be all right. He'd be and by the way, you know as well as anybody, the player's gonna say, No, I'm okay. Yeah, of course. It's our it's our instinct to, to get up. We don't let anyone down. Don't let anybody down. Maybe that att attitude slightly needs to shift. Maybe. Maybe part of the culture setting up, you can win at all costs. You know, performance and winning culture versus you know long-term health culture, but th these are all really interesting points. Up and I complex hope, too, and, and incredibly complex. Where there is no right or wrong answer, there are a few points I'd like to make, and I've said this before. For I could make an argument that as a parent, it would be significantly safer to see my child play a contact sport versus poetry. There's enough numbers and enough data out there to make that argument. But I don't, I couldn't imagine poetry class comes with a parentally advisory warning. Like, are you sure you want to, like, or, you know, you're sat around the, the, the kid's birthday party, at, you know, the seventh or eighth birthday party. It's like, oh, my kids just started poetry. You go, really? You're letting them do that? Wow where it would happen, like, they're going to play tackle. 
Yeah. Ooh. Are you serious? Really? But don't you know about what about what about head knocks? Yep. Oh yeah. But and I'm sh- I could show you the numbers on poetry where you th- that conversation. Oh, that's brilliant. It really helped their creative side. Hmm. Might be some long term consequences into the future. One of the focus, one of the areas of focus that I'm really passionate about, and one of the reasons I'm, you know, like yourself, part of the Concussion Legacy Foundation Australia is, I view our sport for for myself and for a huge cohort of individuals that have already played the game. What's done is done. Mm. We can. I, you can't cease the decline. But you can hit the accelerator, which I know a lot of people do, and you hit the brakes, which unfortunately not a lot of people do. The accelerator being not exercising, alcohol and other substance abuse, well, smoking, booze, lack, of, lack of social engagement. The, the exercise one is key. I know I was listening to, to a podcast with you. Um, with uh, 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 Louisa Nicola. Yeah. Talking about you know the impo- like headline, you know, clickbait, the key ingredient to you know you know uh, for to increase the health span or lifespan. <gasps> I'll click on that exercise, yeah. vigorous exercise every time, and you're like high intensity ah, stuff. Wait, can I buy it? Can I get? Ha, can I get a you know subscription to this pill to come to my house? No, no, no. You've got to go and bust your ass for you know three, four hours a week. Oh. And it's free. Yeah, you can do it down Bondi Beach. You can do it anywhere. Go run in the street. It's free. Yeah. Oh. It just costs you your time. And commitment. And commitment. But it, there's so many benefits of helping build resilience. I know sometimes I'm training, I'm like, oh, God, what am I doing? Like, I cannot be bothered doing this today. And you just force yourself to do it. And like it builds resilience. It makes you actually, resilience is the wrong word. It's anti-fragile. It makes you stronger. You're not resisting. You're actually, you're getting better under pressure. But, But unfortunately, a lot of people that have been in positions where they've, you know, been exposed to a high number of collisions, number of concussions, they don't have this information available to them. And you see a lot of people, I know Nicola said, like, they, they walk themselves into age-related disease. Well, they hit, for my, in my opinion, they're not walking. They're hitting the accelerator. The handbrake's off. They're just going straight there through poor choices. And I think a lot of them are doing it. They're pleading ignorance through it. I think it's ignorance. Because I, 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 I know people who think, I'll just go for a walk. It's got to be high intensity. Yeah. You're better off doing 25 minutes of high intensity than doing an hour and a half walk. I mean, I, I mean, most people don't realise it's you've got to um, you need to do resistance work. Yeah, and resistance doesn't mean you're going to live 100 kilos bench bench 100 kilos, but it doesn't mean you just sit there, uh, you know, bench and 10 kilos uh, somewhere in between. I mean, I listen to the Hoopman Lab podcast all the time, and, uh, and 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 it's a common theme. Louisa Nicola, there's a common theme across the board, you know, Lex Freeman, whoever it is, you know, um, they all say that exercise, um, you know, intensity, with high intensity, doesn't mean every single day, you don't have to be ridiculous about it, but exercise, high intensity exercise, solves a lot of issues. On the flip side of that, they say, though, too, there's usually you'll find there's no booze involved in that. They're not drinking. Um, you know, and unfortunately, in our game, there's a, an association with drinking. It's okay when you're younger, I guess, to some extent, but as you get older, you can't carry it on. So, if, you know, if you want to extend your life, quality of life, and your life, and I'm, you know, because of my age, I'm very acutely aware of all this stuff. I mean, I, I don't drink. I mean, when I say don't, drink, I might have one drink a week, and I don't mean twenty drinks once a week. I mean one drink a week. <laughs> but I did have used to have twenty drinks. A day at one stage, but when I was a young, lot younger, but no drink, definitely no drugs. Um, good, good uh, health, uh, food, and nutrition. Nutrition is important. 
lots of this stuff here. Well, they try and drink it out of a tap. Um, high intensity exercise at least three times a week. Um, and good sleep. That Louisa Nicola uh, podcast we did on my straight talk. Um, that's I think it's one of the most ex- one of the most highly watched and shared um, podcasts I, I've ever done, and it might have got you know hundreds and hundreds hundreds of thousands worth of shares. And the part that everyone sat, seemed to sit on because you can look at daytime uh, time stamp it is the part about sleep. Yeah, how important sleep is, and you won't sleep properly unless you exercise properly. And you won't sleep properly if you have a cup of coffee at five o'clock in the afternoon. It's all about being sensible. Sensible, intelligent, but we said it before, scientific stuff. Like, what is the science telling us? And then as a club, like like Minnie's helping us out with our players at the moment in terms of, um, you know, we have fasting days and, uh, you know, like, what do you put in your gut? You know, what type of food do you eat? Um, it just, like, but all scientifically based. Yeah. If you remember, many had two back operations. No one ever goes back and plays rugby league and, and more, plays for Australia, then plays the origin for Australia after two back operations. Like, that's it, they're out. But he did it through commitment, exercise, in his own time. He couldn't play for a couple of years. But diet, you know, like a clean diet. So, you know, we're getting, getting down into territories about you know, clean diets, b- breathing systems, you know, how you breathe, learning how to breathe properly, like breathing meditation. It is all weird stuff. Like if you had to say something like this to, um, you know, uh, Georgie Talforth from the Bulldogs in the 70s or Kevin Ryan or something like that, they went, what the fuck? What are you talking about? But learning how to breathe, learning how to meditate, learning how to eat properly, learning how to train properly, um, you know, knowing the effects of alcohol and, and coffee. Coffee's good for you, but like at certain times. You know, like, and what's the science say about these things? And how do we share the science? It's all the slight edge. That's all. Yeah, You've got your fundamentals. Those are the slight edges. And there's something that I, I guess, well, sorry, not the slight edge. The sleep and the nutrition part, I think they're re- really easy to control. But again, you know, what is good nutrition? Yeah. Like, you know, I think if you ask people, Experts would be dumbfounded what people think good nutrition is. Mm. Dumbfounded. Yeah. And I'm, I, I reckon if I, I'd say, yeah, okay, part of the reason I exercise is because I probably think I don't have to focus too much on what I put in at this moment in time, but I know it could improve it. But I'd probably, being a footballer, I'd probably need someone like that, Louisa, to come around or go to the supermarket, or not to the supermarket, likely, probably not the supermarket, go to a farmer's market and go, this is what you're having. Because we are I'm two years out of the systems of that regimented, like, this is what you wear, this is where you need to be, this is your weights program, this is your, right on the line, when I blow the whistle, you've got five seconds to get to the 20. You know, oh, good nutrition. It's just, you know, oh, I don't see it. Like, I actually read an article the other day uh, from on the ABC about you know, um, these foods are highly processed foods that you may not realise. And I was like, shit, I consume them and I I think they were highly processed. Oh, whoops. Well, I've had some exposure to it with a guy called the Fight Dietitian. His name's Brennan um, uh, Jordan Sullivan, I should say, and um, Jordy's currently over in Perth um, with uh, Volkanovski and all those other guys because he he does the diets for these guys um, to not just weigh make weight, but more impo- probably more importantly, not be dehydrated, but also be strong and and, and be healthy. And um, he does a lot of UFC fighters, like world champions. He looks after Adesanya, like a lot of other people, right? And uh, and I had some exposure many years ago. I I, I prepared for a fight myself with him and. Uh, and uh, what was very interesting um, in terms of what is important, like scientifically, we all got different requirements and it's important. I, I mean, I know not everyone can afford it, but I get that. But I'm just saying it's important to recognise that each one of us has a different baseline as to what we need in our gut and, uh, and what works for us. And you need to be just be a bit more, bit more experimental, just try different things. Um, and just see how you feel. How do you feel? It's not a bad guide. 
um, it, it, most of us so think, oh, I, I tell you how I used to be. This is my Friday. Friday afternoon, after work, me and my mates, we were going to train our asses off. Like, just go mental. Then we go out. We thought that entitled us to go out and drink 15 schooners and eat, go to the greasy mile after that and eat whatever we could eat and probably end up spewing or something like that. Yeah, I've earned this. It's, yeah. It's, it's but that was okay. The, well, it's calories in the bank. I thought it was okay. Yeah. Like I thought, oh, well, that's how I trained. Yeah, yeah. And then get up in the morning, the next mo- the next day at lunchtime when it's hot and put a backpack on, fill it full of sand and go for a run. Because that's how you, uh, man, like the world's moved way beyond that now. And, uh, and who knows what damage I've done, we've done in those periods. But, from now on, I'm much more. I approach these things much more scientifically, and not not me as a scientist, but me. Rel- and the great thing about it, podcasts is that you can go dial in pretty much anywhere you want, and you can find out the really good information about the stuff that's important for you, or at least you can find five different points of view, and you can land where you think is important. And that's a great uh, to me. Like people talk about social media, uh, it's this, that, and the other. Well, I pick and choose my social media, but I pick and choose what I think is either entertaining or valuable to me. And what I consider my, my values are around living longer and living better. They're, they're my, right now, they're my major things. You know, I want to live, my youngest son who's 31, I've got four boys, my oldest boy's 42 or something, the youngest boy's 31. I was looking at him a little while ago and I decided that I want to, to live long enough to see him be my age now so i can see what i see in myself right now so i worked out i could live another 35 years it takes me to um ripe old age just under 100 um and i'm serious about this people say oh you wanker like no i would like to live to that period but there's no point in me would liking it i've got to do something about it and so i'm actually jumping into all these areas i'm really interested in um you know should i take cbd oil to sleep better at night and i've tried it it doesn't work for me it just just makes me feel a bit weird but i'm trying different stuff nothing dangerous and i'm researching and i'm and i'm I'm talking to minicellas i talk to as many people as i can you're trying to stack the odds in your favor trying to you can't go like actually can't change my genetics but no genetics are at the moment they they can't be changed but I actually do a presentation on this called Stacking the Odds in Your Favour. You've got a desired outcome. Yep. Work backwards. You can't guarantee it, but you can make choices along the way to help or hinder that possible outcome Correct. happening. Like and, you, like, and again, this is where you go, well, what's the slight edge? I've got my fundamental building blocks of sleep, nutrition, exercise. You know, Is it infrared sauna versus hot cold sauna? Is it plunge pool? Is it ice baths? Is it cold showers? Is it um, breathing you know, like Wim Hof breathing? Br- Wim Hof breathing. Is it you know one of the things I've implemented into my daily routine now is charging my mobile phone downstairs and there's a when I go to bed and there's a there's a couple of reasons why I do that. I find it so helpful in that ability to switch off at night time. It makes such a world of difference. It's just one little habit. Totally. It's like you know I, I assessed my life and I was like what. what doing taking this to bed i've also got young kids and it's like when they get to an age where they have mobile phones it's like well, do i want them to have phones in the bedroom no well then why is it fair that i do and my wife does but not them we we'll charge downstairs and also i'm just scrolling through shit the overwhelming majority of thing time things that are uninteresting uh, it's just shit and tripe yeah it's brain damage stuff too like yeah. the, the, some things and sometimes you can just uh, 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 land on something by the way that you shouldn't like it's damaging like oh. it's going to cause you a problem it, you think it, about it, it fuck yeah, yeah it, it's actually you know what's funny i was watching my daughter swim yesterday after school just she's seven and um i looked at this parent next to me and their kids in the class as well she was on her phone, like scrolling through Instagram, and I can't found it like really difficult not to like look. I'm enjoying this moment, you know, and she she's there looking at people that she doesn't know, 
put videos up of the rain. <laughs> and one of the, th- I looked down, I was like, what rain? Yeah, the window. Yeah. I'm like, why would I care? That I know it's raining. Yeah, I yeah. drove here. Yeah. It was pissing down. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's, it's a, you know, probably a top 10% rain day of the year. So yeah. I don't need anybody else to tell me that it's raining. Yeah, totally. You know, if there's a danger, yes. But not what rain. Like, fucking be present. Even the moment um, LeBron James put the point scoring record, seeing the photograph and the crowd. Everybody. Everybody. Minus one or two, and I think those are the people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm and becoming, like you, very much rule-based. That is... I have rules around what I eat, when I eat, what time I eat, what time when I train, how long I train for, who I train with, what time I go to bed, what I do with my phone. Um, unfortunately, I've, I because unless I have structure around me, I'm all over the joint. So I, you know, mentally I'm all over the joint, and uh, so I find it works for me to have a whole set of rules that you know I do some research on, and I, I'm similarly I turn my phone off a certain time at night. I don't look at it, and I don't turn on until a certain time of day. In the morning, after a certain period, um, and is I that why you didn't message me back last night? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great excuse. Hey, what about that for a great excuse not to get back to people? But it's real for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, sorry, not an excuse. It's a reason. It's, it's, and, and it's yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't talk, and and I don't have any difficulty whatsoever yeah. saying, look, I don't look at my phone after a certain time, mm. and I don't look at it again until a certain time. Yeah, and don't be afraid to say that. Yeah, yeah. all this bullshit that people think is oh. You know, like I, I remember, I used to hear this when I many many years ago when I was working in a law firm, and uh, when I was in my thirties, uh, we acted for a, for, uh, an organisation called Bond Corporation, which is a very famous uh, business in those days. There was a guy called Alan Bond, and uh, like he was like a, you know, like a very famous guy anyway. And there's all these myths about him, mysteries, and he used to only, and the big myth was he only used to sleep four hours a night, and he was a genius, and he could, and he'd get four hours sleep, and he could, you know, be back on the phone to you at four a.m. in the morning. And he'd be just as good as he was when he left you at midnight, whatever it was. And uh, I, at one stage, I thought that's the way well, I've got to be that way. But that's all bullshit. That, 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 those, I mean, that, that's how you, you don't don't survive. You end up crashing. People used to say that about Einstein, but Einstein actually used to sleep during the day as well. So the bottom line is, work out some rules for yourself that work. Don't go and try and emulate other people just because there's some sort of mystery or myth being uh, produced by whoever it is, newspapers or whoever it is or the, by the individual themselves, about themselves, um, start to build rules for yourself based on some science that allow you to live your best possible life. That's, that's important. I think Whether you're 19 or 99. I think, uh, I don't know if you ever listened to Jocko Wilner. Yeah, I do. says, you know, structure and discipline. Yeah, totally. That's freedom. Yeah, I listen to him. I've heard Joe freedom. Rogan interview him a few times. Jock and Willing. I think he's coming out. No, he's co- he was coming out this year, but he cancelled his tour. But he was coming out to Australia this year, oh. but he cancelled his tour. But uh, yeah, Jocko Willink. Uh, you know what's an interesting thing about all these individuals? Most of them that these guys and, and I don't know what the why the common denominator exists, but a lot of them do. A lot of them are um, wrestlers or jujitsu exponents. Mm. Quite a lot of them. It's quite interesting. Like Lex Friedman is another one. Yeah. That they're all they all they're all you know high level um, uh, proponents of jujitsu or, or yeah, a wrestling lot of black belt in amongst that, something in amongst that community judo or something like that yeah, yeah Joe Rogan is too he's he's a he's a brown belt I think um, in uh, jujitsu but it's sort of interesting and they're all very serious about their exercise yeah and uh, and I don't, I've ne- I've never known why what the common denominator why the common denominator exists um, but it's quite quite an interesting phenomenon that I've I've noticed. But we're lucky we can listen to this stuff yeah. these days. You know, like mm. your old man and your grandparents and mine, they never had anything like this. We could just have it in, in your podcast now. We're talking about it right now. And, and that's, I think that's the reason why people should find a podcast they like that's, A, a entertaining, that they like the dudes involved, but also has got interesting guests on there that can sort of give me something that I can take away from me. And if it's, if it's not interesting, I'll just turn that one off and away for the next one. A good bloke I, I listened to on, on Joe Rogan was this uh, British bodybuilder called Dorian Yates. And he studied before the days of the internet how to be the best bodybuilder. And he he's like 10 time... I can um, tell you've been listening. Yeah, <laughs> he's like 10 time Mr. Olympia. And it was all off the back 
of his own research. He's a fascinating listen, an absolutely fascinating listen. It, the first half is about that, and then it goes into his psychedelic um, drug use, which is and that's not also, for me, pr- also pretty interesting. It's interesting. Well. It's not for me, but I mean, only because I'm too scared. I, I don't. I'm too scared of what might happen. I don't want to try it. But um, and I grew up in the acid era when I was at uni, and I saw too much weird shit happening, and it's sort of scares me a little bit. Um, you know, I don't care if it's a microdose or not. I just just don't like the idea of it. But, but Australia, I, I, Australia has just announced actually that I think they're going to be the first country to do clinical trials on psilocybin and MDMA. Yeah, f- for, for post- to help traumatic, people with mental illness. Post-traumatic stress and depression. treatment-resistant depression. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Yeah, and and I've never really... I don't think I have any of those, but uh, maybe I do, but I don't know about it, but I don't think I do, so I, I, I take the view that it's not for me, but, like, it, it is extremely interesting. Like, it, you know, like, uh, Mike Tyson is a big investor in a massive business in the US that is all about psychedelics. Yeah. Apart from being a big investor and a big owner of a marijuana business mm. in California where you can, where it's legal to smoke it. But yeah, so those, you know, and who would have thought Mike Tyson, but he probably does con- uh, does have PTSD of some type, I'm sure. I feel like he's had some pretty serious shit happen to him in his life. I mean, even Tyson stuff's pretty fascinating too. I mean, I don't know if you listen to uh, um, hot, whatever you call it, hot, hot something. I, they smoke, they smoke hot, hot boxing. ones. Oh, yeah, they smoke hot ones or anything mm. like that. But still, it's pretty interesting. And he's getting all the same dudes on Lex Friedman. He gets on yeah. Ray, He gets all the same. They're all got the same individuals, which is why their why their podcasts blow up because um, in terms of getting lots of numbers because they're all uh, building each other. Yeah, you know, like I'll go on yours, you go on mine yeah. later. Here in Australia, we don't have that. I mean, I'm on yours. You know, you'll be on mine, and we, you know, we, but our audiences are relatively speaking smaller than everybody else because we've got a smaller country, but and you know, we're, and therefore you're less famous. But but it's sort of interesting how the podcast world's working. I, I love the podcast world. I, I find it fascinating. I really do find it fascinating. I mean, coming out to your studio is fantastic. I mean, you've got a great little studio with your pool table and ring over there. <laughs> but but I, no, I'm serious. Yeah. It's, well, it's, this I must admit, this isn't our studio. This is the Hello Sport Boy Studio. So. Big shout out but to it them. still is pretty cool though. It like is. It, it, I mean, I, the the podcast community, I find so generous, so caring. Look after one another. Well, I've been out to the Batuta one. The Batuta one, they have quite a few guys. Different guys do um, different podcasts there as well. And the Batuta guys are really cool too. Um, you know, yeah, our studios. You know, we host other other podcasts as well. You know, I've been out the Spaniards one. There, it's a. Uh, it, it people don't realize it's actually it's a community of people. Yeah, it is. All, all, all just chilling and doing their best and trying to make it more interesting and learning as we go along. And none of us know what the fuck we're doing. We're, we're sort of making up as we go a little bit. I certainly, I've done eight years of this now. Oh, wow. I, when I first started my podcast, I used to call it My Borough Show. And uh, I don't know why I called it. I don't even know why I did it. I just did it because I had no, nothing to do. I thought I would do it It'd be for fun because I used to listen to This, um, uh, this American Life. And uh, I thought I'll, I'll do one in Australia. And uh, we did it all wrong. And, you know, we had sometimes six guests in the in the podcast and you can't control you, you know how one guest hard enough having six is like impossible and uh didn't make any money um it's still still hard to make money out of these things um uh it doesn't matter how big your audience is but it, it's it's such fun it's it just is. cool you know and you learn so much you do to me is what you learn you know you pick up one little thing every time and you learn something about anything about it later or you might not think about it for months and if you can put it into your life somewhere that's 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 important yeah i was gonna say like how much you have such a wide variety of guests um from all different walks of life how often do you action something that they say it's changed my life i honestly can say it's changed my life it's changed my approach to life um i approach things differently i think about stuff with a different mindset and I don't mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about some evangelistic, you know, it's not a, a Christianity awakening or something. Um, but just, we tend to think our approach is the only approach. But when you see everyone else's approach, you learn, oh, well, that's not about, I might try that. You know, it's, it's probably about my, I probably, the thing that I've, that I've changed the most is my mindset about how I go about my, the business of my life. And I don't mean business in my life, I mean, 
be my Boris, how I go about it, uh, how I think about things, how I approach things, um, how judgmental I should be or shouldn't be, um, uh, how much research should I do, where do I do my research, who should I talk to about this particular topic, um, you know, and how to be efficient. You know, uh, you know, like, like this morning I had, had an accident, like when I was training, and, you know, like I was rolling with a guy who was bigger and better than me, much more experienced. And I hurt myself, right? So ordinarily what I would have done, as I wouldn't give a shit about it, we were going to take some phenidine four days on with that and I would have done nothing about it and would have got worse and I would have suffered. But these days I've learned how to become much more efficient. I'm, I'm quickly on the phone to look and who can I ring? I'm, I'm lucky I'm at the roost so I can ring some of the roost. But I, even when I was at the roost 20 years ago, I wouldn't have rung the roost's uh, doctor. Wouldn't have done it. Um, I would have thought, nah, it's not cool, or I would, I just would have just let it go. So I've learned my mindset now is to be very efficient in everything I do. And you use the word right at the beginning of this show, uh, leverage. It's not leverage, it's access. And if you go about it the right way, look at if if you're not too busy, do you mind if I can I see you or, I, you know, have you got time? You got five minutes? I'll go out and talk to you. Um, or if you are to be tell me I'll, I'll, I won't talk to you I'll go somewhere else I'll try something else and you know, worst case scenario you go and talk go, go to the hospital if it's that bad but I've learned how to access people who are in my life and I've got that out of doing the podcast because people in my podcast do exactly the same with me and I never used to think about that I, I was the guy giving and I don't think I'm taking but I'm accessing that's important so my, my life's changed Young guys, I mean, I got Simon here, you know, from our, our team. Everyone in my pod, everyone who does my podcast, everyone who works for me in the podcast business, is under, I think, twenty six or something like that, some like twenty two, twenty three. Normally, I used to think, you do what I fucking say, because I'm the boss, I'm paying the wages. I changed my mind about that. Like, I listen to what they got to say because they know about the audience, a certain segment of the audience, much better than I do, because they are part of the audience they, they represent a certain age group gen z and uh so i've learned patience i've learned um be consultative more communicative more communicative more understanding less judgmental and people tell me i'm a better person which tells me i was probably an arsehole before but you know it's all good <laughs> <laughs> hey just speaking about forecasting looking ahead learning a um, couple of new players on the scene. Wearable health, I've heard you talk about that. Um, yeah, that could be a, a real game changer, especially with things around concussion as well. Um, I'm not too, not too sure how much you know about this chat GPT. I've used it. I use it. You use it. How big a player is this likely to be? And could the NRL use it? a club like the Sydney Roosters use it. Is this something that, before we know it, we're going to be using without even knowing we're using? Well, Chap GPT is a piece of software that's been developed by some smart guys in the US that scrapes the internet to, l to learn about a topic that you might type into the app. So you go on the app, you download the app, I should say, you go and ask the app a question, like, you know, what's going to happen with interest rates in the March meeting? What's the Reserve Bank of Australia going to do? ChatGPT goes in and scrapes everything that's on the internet that relates to that question and then compiles it into an answer that it has learnt to, to be the most... The word popular is not right, but the most correct answer based on what popular opinion is. And it then types it out for you and gives you an answer. So it then, and which then becomes what they call artificial intelligence. In other words, it's making a recommendation to you, an intellectual re recommendation to you, based on what the software learns from what all of us say, people in my game, say about what the Reserve Bank's gonna say. So. 
I might have said something about the Reserve Bank, what I think they're going to do, and 500 other people might have said the same thing in Australia. And uh, it learns from what we're all saying and it looks at what's where the common, the common themes are and it builds a common theme answer. It's not actually intelligent because if none of us had put anything up there, it couldn't learn anything. So it couldn't give you an answer. It won't give you an answer. It'll, it'll probably come back and say, look, there's not enough information out there to answer your question. So what it does is it learns from what all of us are saying in that particular topic and then compiles what is the common denominator between all of us and then just writes that nicely for you in a, in a nice format. So I think we are along, you know, it's a topic quite dear to my heart, um, we are a long way off chat GPT giving us anything really valuable, really valuable until it evolves a lot more and more importantly until it learns a lot more. It's got to keep learning for a couple of years yet. If I say take ChatGPT out of the formula and just leave that alone for a second, but just say if you ask me how, what can artificial intelligence do and how can machines learn through sensors on our body, for example, more about performance, for argument's sake, of a player at a club level, that I think there's a big future for clubs to make use of. So as you know, we have right behind the GPS stuff right now, um, but there are there is sensor technology out there that can that is now being used, which is just like a little stick on thing that might tell you about your heartbeat when you're doing bench press. It might tell you what your optimum weight is for uh, for any one particular player. But then it can rate, you know, Brandon Smith against all, all other number twelves, number nines, I should say. It used to be twelve, is now number nine. Um, uh, or it could, uh, and then it could rate them against all people. Then it might also overlay, but also uh, overlay um, number nines who are 100 kilos versus, and, you know, 175 centimetres versus, you know, taller, taller hookers or taller um, dummy halves. And so artificial intelligence over time will start to give us. Um, measure measurable p things that we can measure ourselves or clubs can measure their their, t their players and all the players particular performance in certain things against and make decisions whether or not that player can improve or that in play that player right now is is optimized chat gbt is um more for um people who want to write a speech and it says look what are the 10 most inspiring speeches about um, democracy? And I'm the Prime Minister, I want to talk about democracy. So give me, give me a speech that I'm going to talk to the Australian people about the democ democracy and you know, it will write you a good speech. Um, but equally, there are now other softwares out there and other apps out there actually that um, I think it's called Open, Open Chat or something like that. Or chat open or something like that where I can actually go and put your speech that you got off chat GP into that app and it'll tell me that you got it off chat GPT. So there's now yeah. there's now other apps out there that can check whether or where you got it from. And there's actually quite a lot of those, <laughs> to be honest with you. So but artificial intelligence is really important and uh, and but it's probably at a really immature stage yet. And machine but machines do learn, but for machines to learn they need sensors. And and the sensors are only learning from the places the sensors are put. And it depends what we're collecting data on. Sweat, uh, muscle tension, it could be a, a sensor, says muscle tension, um, a sense, it might be heartbeat, uh, uh, might be, a, might be a t uh, t uh, looking at um, uh, uh, heart rate. Yeah, saliva, blood. S saliva, yeah. bl um, you know, uh, but also other things like um, blood pressure. Mm. You know, like there's no point you doing a bench press and doing one and fucking your heart bursts. Something where you have a, a brain tumor or you have a brain hemorrhage, so it's about optimization, and I think that's where artificial intelligence will land. And I really think the best application, to be frank with you, is in um, medical environments, or health, in, or health environments, which is important for players. How do we help players optimize themselves? I think we'll have jerseys soon with sensors all over them, where it's not like the thing that sticks out the back, yeah. the GPS thing. 
but which measures how far you run and stuff like that. But sensors all over it where it's not um, intrusive on the player, but it's just part of the player's kit. Like I know that there are now there are now bras around and also jocks around that um, measure baselines for just normal people, everyday people measure baselines for you about um, heart rate, blood pressure, sweat. Um, you know, steps and all that sort of stuff. Similar to these wearables, but they're things that are in, um, embedded on your on your system, on your body. Bras or, sh- or jocks, they're all being trialled now at the moment and they have really great sensor systems inside them. And then the machine learns from the sensors and then the machine produces an optimum outcome, which is allegedly artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, I saw a... Um, I, I was a chairman of a technology company many years ago um, which ha- was a, like a world-leading, a Chicago-based company, world-leading in um, sensor technology. And uh, we used to be able to put this very small lock, it wasn't a lock, uh, it was a little sensor within the lock, inside lockers. We could sense if someone put a gun inside a locker at an airport. We could sense um, gunpowder, metal, and we could sense, uh, in those days, anthrax was being sent around the world in, in envelopes. We could sense as anthrax was going through the mail system off to the president or wherever it is um, and these sensors could sense t- uh, heat humidity all sorts of things and now now most of the tech big tech companies around the world use our technology or I'm not there anymore but use that technology um, in terms of um, running data centers and and um, um, uh, you know, data in um, servers that sit in data centers these days so sensor technology is probably at the heart or the effectiveness of how good AI will be in delivering us optimization in the future. And to me, it's really obvious that players, will s- 10 years from now, will be telling us so much stuff. And what I hope to see is there might be a little uh, uh, dashboard on the side of my TV or whatever the hell it is I'm watching the game on, and it might be telling me that Victor Radley now is uh, running at capacity on the field. And his heart rate is blah, and uh, whereas uh, you know they won't be playing, but James Tedesco, who's doing the same thing, his heart rate's only like seventy-two, or or Jared might have got upset by um, Burgess, who just knocked out um, <laughs> Teddy, <laughs> and uh, in the you know the game before the, the the playoffs, and Jared's heart rate, who is now the captain, who's talking to the referee. Heart rate's gone to 180. Or is adrenaline spot? It's gone spot. mental. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the coach can see it and he says, we better pull Jared off or let's g- get Jared to come off for five minutes and do a Wim Hof and uh, do the, uh, the, you know, the Nadi Shadana breathing system where he breathes out longer than he breathes in and we can calm him down and send him back on. Or it could be for actual like, physical performance as well. It could be, okay, this guy's salt level is yeah. down. Hydration. Get down. some salt into him. Salt need to yeah. optimize this. You know, we're going into ex- extra target golden point. The artificial, all these sensors relay this information. Here's your drink. Oh, Brandon, you need this. Yeah. You know, this is what you. This is totally what the machine Indi- is individualized you. optimization. Yeah. And yeah. I can see sensors doing that. Wouldn't it be great though if we're watching it, and we could sort of see the chess game being played yeah. by the coach and by the coaching group saying, shit, let's move that over here and move that down there and let's put uh, a semi on the wing because he's fatiguing because the game's going too fast and we'll put, him on, we'll put him out wide so he doesn't have to tackle anybody. And then we'll bring him, oh, his heart rate, everything's back, into, let's bring him back into the, the halfback 5'8 position or put him back in a halfback. And then Trent's in the coach's box typing into chat. GPT, what should I say to the boys at halftime? Totally. It's 16-4. Well, I'm serious, that's, <laughs> just, that's gonna happen. Yeah. What's my speech? Yeah, what, what, hey, what should I say? How do I what, get them up? What, oh, do, and of this information, you know, you could maybe there's things around the brain, emotional state, you know, hormone levels. What should I, what should I say to this guy? What, what emotional triggers? What words can I use to get the best response from James Tedesco? Well, With forty minutes to go. Tell me, Jack GPT, and then it relays into Robert's ear, and he goes, "Mate, I'm telling you this now. It's coming from the heart." Yeah, <laughs> you know, you could. You, you, it, it's not for me beyond the realms of of, of one hundred percent. Like, in, and we will know which referees trigger certain players. Uh, there'll be it'll be a robot. I've been advocating this for a long time. It'll be a robot. It'll yeah. be a robot. 
could be no, Cameron Smith. <clears throat> maybe Cameron Smith could. He could p- perhaps influence a robot referee. Say, so, come on. Yeah, just give us two minutes. Let me just tie my bootlaces while we get ready to defend this dropout set. But most people wouldn't be able to emotionally engage with a robot referee. Doesn't care who you are. Doesn't ca- the robot referee doesn't totally. care about the crowd. Not giving you, st- you no, know, it plays by the rules. Another question is: Do you want to get? Do you want to game play by the rules? People assume they do. I don't know if they do. We don't want Squid Games. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think we do. I'm not sure. Maybe we do. But we don't. Hey, sometimes we don't know what yeah, we want. Well, well, totally. Yeah. You know the interesting thing about Chat GPT. So I spoke to a, a teacher friend of mine, who said he used it and just was playing around, saying, "Can you write me a lesson plan for blah blah blah?" And he said normally it'd take him a good hour and a half to do it well. It's not his strong point, but it, he watched he watched Chat GPT write out this lesson plan in about six minutes which normally took him 90 and he was like wow this is this is really interesting so i went on you know being a a, a media pundit uh, i asked chat gpt who's going to win the nrl 2003 season oh uh, yeah basically just sat on the 2023 fence. yeah yeah it basically just sat on the fence yeah well i asked the, the same f- question. F- fence sitter yeah chat gpt is a fence sitter yeah, no. when it comes to predicting sport uh, outcomes, uh, and same as interest rates it gave me exactly the same outcome yeah. it just said on one hand this and one yeah. hand and that Get off the fence, chat, chat, beat it. Put, well, I, I, put your balls on. The I don't line. think it's learned enough yet because it, 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 it's too early. Yeah. But I tell you something that I know. I know somebody who uses Chat GPT, the app, to write code for her. So when she's got to write uh, write code in Python for, and she's a biomedical engineer, so she has to do. She actually writes code for uh, predicting epileptic fits, and when. And, and, and if you're gonna, if you're a code writer, and you know you're a computer programmer, and you're sitting down there to write the code, it takes a long time. Um, she's used ChatGPT to actually, which goes into goes to all the places where this stuff gets discussed on YouTube and every other place, and just scrapes it and actually writes the code for you. And you've got to play around a little bit, but it saves like days. Yeah. And so that that it's really good on that sort of stuff. It's got its benefits, and it's exciting, scary to wear it. I think it's cool it, though. Yeah. Oh, man, it's fa- it's fascinating. I, I find it, it it is scary, but I also find it really cool, like really exciting. You know, like as like you and I just sort of imagine this. Yeah. You made like you know players, and then and by the way, at the end of the day, that's that's a great thing for the players because it's for their benefit. It's going to be great for them. They'll mm. play better, but also will eliminate some of the danger out of them. You know, being dehydrated reduced, or whatever. Reduced the case in, injury risk. Hundred percent optimize performances and make them more confident that we are looking after them mm. you know we are undertaking our duty of care like as a co- in the coaching box in relation to what they're doing on the field i wonder if it will ever get to a stage where it's part of retention and recruitment it l- probably already is who's got well who's got the best yeah you're right who's got the the best system for optimizing players if i'm a new player or i'm a player wanting to transfer then i might want to go to that organization so technology will be a big recruitment plus but then i wonder if you get like like i say we're emotional creatures so you've got that performance side but you've also that connection and people side so the best players don't necessarily make the best team like who complement will it be able to understand who complements each other enough and say say Tedesco gets to 31 like past the peak of his powers and never you know, the wear never the wear well the wearable tech is saying or all this information uh, or the artificial intelligence says it's time to let him go it might give him another couple of years though but it might it might but it also might take him away you know for the benefit of the you know we I talk about being tribal being emotional can we let this club legend go off the back of what an uh, off information AI has given us? No, but because we might. You, but, you know, you know but, but we might say at the end of the day, you're right. But we might also say, look, for the benefit of the team and the and the culture that he brings to the joint, um, we're going to keep him there for a while. We're going to keep him there for a year, and we've done that with, in the part. We do that anyway. I mean, clubs do that yeah. all the time. Yeah, they they do. But um, you know overriding the data yeah like who 
Do you make special exemptions for people like him? Yeah, of course you do. 100% you do. Um, At the moment, we do. At the moment. But would you, would you let the... But you in, you know, as these things become more commonplace, then just does it become just accepted that, well, the computer knows more, uh, artificial intelligence kno knows more than us, that must be making the right decision. And that would, wouldn't, I wonder if it would have the possibility to learn that and gauge the um, human skills and emotion and feeling that Player X brings to organization Y? Um, well, maybe it will, but what, we, what I really worry about, what I actually worry about is if the computer starts to game us. So... It gets hacked. Yeah, and, the, and, and the computer works out, hang on, uh, someone's hacked me and they put a bet on um, West Tigers winning, so I really better go and um, uh, sabotage the Roosters. And uh, it's tell them that they've got to get rid of James Tedesco because the data says that um, he's this, that, and the other. Um, but uh, like all these possibilities. Yeah. I mean, oh, the, yeah. The, the total possibilities. Yeah. I mean, uh, and to, I find that exciting, though. I know that's yes. scary, but it's exciting for me because then I got out. How do we outsmart it? Or how do we put in things to stop that from happening? And uh, that's exciting to me. Like, that's like, uh, I don't know. Hunger Games type excitement to me. That that's really cool shit. The like, future, uh, the future, the future is exciting, especially in footy, mate. Especially in footy. That actually we sort of brushed over it a little bit before. Um, the future is exciting. Um, and I, I did ask you about the NRL's future plans, but I look at the examples happen that happened in America. Uh, you got the four main sporting organizations. Two have gone global: NFL and NBA. They really have a footprint here in Australia now, as they do in England. Um, basketball is huge in Japan, where I don't see the same advancements from baseball and um, NHL. A little bit, but not as much. I know baseball is big in, 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 in a number of other countries, but is that something that the NRL should look to do? You know, We spoke about we're competing with, really with AFL and NRL. They're at the top of the domestic tree. Rugby unions, big trump card is, hey, we're a global game. Is that something that you feel the NRL should be looking to do? I love our game. I come from, a, from an area of in, in England where no rugby is played, yet people got exposure to our sport through me, and they fell in love with the game. And I see it all the time. I speak to English people from non-traditional rugby league areas back home. They come here, they move to Sydney, and because they're thrown into the environment where sport, where rugby league is part of the culture, they fall in love with it. So for me, the product works. The product works with people that haven't grown up with it. I think we should be going into new areas. What are your thoughts? I mean, I'd like to be able to say we should, or we should, but I don't think we'll succeed. And I think the resources required to try to do that should be probably better spent in other areas of the game we just we just don't have enough money to break into the u.s system I and mean, i think the reason baseball doesn't work here is because cricket's really real entrenched and nfl is really entrenched in the u.s so i don't think we're going to replace that with rugby league um or if we did it's going to take a long time like a long long time um i think rugby union's got a better chance of in, uh, breaking into the u.s because it's a global game and it's also played at the olympics and those sorts of things so yeah, I, 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 as much as I'd love to see rugby league become more globally accepted, and you know, I'd like, I mean, look, I sponsored the, uh, um, Australia. I sponsored Australia. I was on the jersey when we played the Tomahawks in uh, when Bennett was a coach um, back in nineteen, I don't know, maybe two thousand or something like that. And I went along to the game in Pennsylvania. <laughs> there was only about fifty people there, and. Uh, I just don't see us being able to cut through because we've got it's just too many entrenched games. I don't think the NFL will, uh, will cut through here in Australia because we're us rugby and NFL is too entrenched. So I think it's, it's plenty of eyeballs, though. Yeah, th it does, but like with the time zone, so it's a Monday morning sport. Generally well, speaking. Well, 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 I don't mean the game. I mean the game being played here. People watch it for sure, um, but no one's going to Netflix. Well, not Netflix, but. Um, the United States broadcasters aren't going to show rugby. If they start showing rugby league, they might be different. And they might start at the state of origin or the test matches or something like that. But I, I don't see um, broadcasters over there showing our... You need a broadcaster on side. You know, you've got to get a broadcaster on side. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, one of the reasons soccer uh, struggles a little bit to get it, get, uh, as opposed to as rusted on, rusted on audience, um, is because it doesn't really have enough TV exposure. Rugby league does here in the AFL. They have a lot of TV exposure. I just think for our game to, for us to invest resources into it, we've got to make sure we've got someone who's going to show it at prime time or something like that. Yeah. I can't see any of the US networks actually doing it because there's not enough money in it for them, not in a big enough audience. So, yeah, I, I, as much as I like it to happen, I, and I've seen them try, you know, they you know, try and do stuff. It's just never worked. Maybe what we should be doing is spending more money in France and Italy and the, you know, the World Cup. Like I saw Greece had a, a team this year and got into the World Cup. You know, in England, uh, Ireland, Scotland, you know, Wales. We should should be spending more time where it already is yeah. more, more more resources where it already is yeah because we've seen like i know when i was a kid um like we're going back like 30 years 25 years ago like if they said oh um argentina as a rugby union country italy japan you laugh it's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. But now those countries are competing on the global level. Like they've had some big scalps recently. Like, is that is that perhaps the model that rugby league, instead of tr- fo- this focus on the states, where it's going to be like, well, hang on, no, let's go to let's go to other areas of the globe. I'd like to see it. I'm just not sure whether or not we have the bandwidth. But, but rugby, I don't think rugby union did at, at that stage either. No, they didn't, but they got in, and now we'd have to. We're going to. We're, we're going to have to dislodge them, or at least sort of get alongside them as well. Um, and they do. It is an Olympic sport too, rugby union. So you know, and they have the sevens too. It's, it just seems to have a big head start on us. I, look, I'd like to see rugby league smash rugby union in every every corner of the world. I mean, I, I'm not a rugby union fan. Like uh, I used to be. I'm not now. It's too complicated. Um, I just can't stand watching it, it's, and it's like a bit schoolboy, school schoolboyish to me. Kick, you know, like you know, throwing the ball in all that. So it's just a very technical game. It just doesn't get me anymore. Um, I used to like it back in the eighties and nineties when I was running rugby. It was around when players got the ball and ran with it <laughs> and actually tried to do something. So I prefer that sort of game. So I'd like I'd love to see rugby league take control, take over its ground. Become a become an Olympic sport if possible. Um, you know, have a bigger sevens or an, we have a nines, but like have a bigger presence in, yeah. in that in the fast game. Um, but I just and I think that there's got to be a reason for it. I don't think it's because of the will of the NRL. I, I don't I don't think and I don't think it's because of the will of the international I, uh, international rugby league, whatever it's called, whatever the international body's called. I don't think it's the lack of will. I think it's. Um, They've worked out the lack of lack of effectiveness in relation to busting into something where the, someone's already got the territory, and uh, and and by the way, rugby union's struggling as well. I mean, they they stay find it pretty hard. I mean, the, the the revenue that goes to rugby union is not that great relative to the size of the game, especially relative to the reach of the game. Um, you know, if you look at the ARU here, it's not doing brilliantly in terms of relative to what the NRL does in terms of money and also the televi- the telecast. So, yeah, as I said, I'd like to see rugby league prevail over everything. But I don't think, I think everyone's got too big a head start on us and I'd like to see any resources that are put into that be put more into where we currently are. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, just to finish up, we've got three questions. We ask every guest. Um, one of them doesn't really apply to you so i'll ask you something different off the of the top um do you have any non-negotiables in business in business do you have any standards anything you just if there's a there's a tell habit. me the truth honesty if you're working with me be honest with me straight up i don't give a fuck whether that's offensive or not but be honest don't fuck around just don't waste my time honesty and, and uh, straight up I like that um the most interesting person you have met. Now, there's a lot of pressure on you here. The Dalai Lama. I actually met him. I was lucky enough to have an audience with him, one on one, and uh, yeah, he was very interesting. He 
he said, I, I can, I'll give you three questions. You can ask me any three questions like, I won't tell you what the three questions were, but they were private, but he gave me the answers. And uh, they were questions about life and uh, that I asked him, things that sort of were in my mind bothering me. And uh, he, he wasn't doing like a, a weird psych thing, or a bit, but just how you live your life, just three questions. And Yeah, he was probably the most interesting and impactful person as I think back on my life, the Dalai Lama, yeah. Whereabouts did you meet him? Sydney. Um, his, one of his, uh, one of the Dalai Lama's nuns, they were called nuns, who go around and do stuff for him, like make sure he's comfortable and look after him, um, was a Buddhist, um, Buddhist monk. Um, she worked for me um, on a property that I owned and uh, she wouldn't take payment because she, they were for arms, but she asked me any money that she would ordinarily uh, earn if she was working for me like, like a normal contractor, that I sent it to um, a charity in Nepal to build uh, wells for people there, you know, to get clean, fresh water, which I did for years. Um, when he came to Australia, she organised me to meet him as, um, as a thank you. He was cool. Like, what was cool about him was his whole aura about him. The whole aura. Like, you felt like you're in the presence of something. You know, like, it was a religious moment, yeah. I'm not Buddhist, but it was a, a really, it had that religious moment about it. Just walking into his presence. And he wasn't doing anything weird. He was very friendly, very polite, extraordinarily powerful guy. Didn't have to see me. He did it at one of his people's requests, but yeah, it was cool. Nice. Um, last question. I often look back at my life at different decisions that could have gone left or right. What's been the biggest sliding doors moment? You. Good or bad? Anything you want. Where you think the alternative choice, what that could have ended up in. Or uh, end, yeah, the, well the, the ramifications of a, of a different choice or a different different I outcome. I don't have one because I've quite a, quite, quite a, probably half a dozen moments where if, if you, if I just leave it at the business level, um, the decision to do the deal with Kerry Packer in um, 1999 was a sliding doors moment for me. Because uh, at one stage, you know, like he basically, well, not him, but his team reduced the amount of money I wanted for, for him to take half my business. They reduced it by half from where we started. You know, they negotiated with me down. They basically crushed me over a long period of time until I got to a point where I was um, deal fatigued and, uh, you know, I could make proper decisions and I thought to myself at one stage, no, I thought, fuck it, I'm not going to do it. I'll walk away from this and I'll get somebody else for more money. But I, but I just listened to my instincts as opposed to my analytics. You know, my analytics said, no, fuck it, walk away. Do it for someone else. Or, or don't do it at all. But my instinct said, just no analytics, no science, nothing. My instinct says, no, you should do this deal with him. I did the deal with him and my life changed. My business life changed. Like, And as you say, doors opened and things, other things, areas closed off, which were problems. Like It just was like walking through a maze of doors opening and closing. It was... I can sort of, I can visualise, I could, if I was an artist, I'd be able to draw it up for you and sh it would look really cool. Like, it is, was a sliding door moment, totally, yeah. And it was just instinct-based, instinct, nothing else. And, you know, it's funny, you know, many years later, I had a partner who was Irish and uh, we went to Ireland together and uh, she took me to see a, a, an astrologist, you know, astrologist, p pretty, apparently pretty famous, in Ireland, and uh, this Irish, uh, this uh, Irish astrologist did all my date of time of birth and all this shit. Came and told me a whole lot of stuff. Looked at, looked at all my how it all works. I don't know how it works. And she said to me, 
don't over you're a person who overanalyzes things, rely on your instincts more. And I am, I'm very analytical about everything. I rely on you know what I read, what I see, what I hear, what I talk about, and I, I analyze everything to the nth degree. Um and she said, sometimes your instincts are much better. And how the hell she knew that about me, I don't know. But she said, that's because I was born on this, <laughs> whatever it is, yeah, under this influence, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that I got told that many years later. And I do rely on my gut a lot still. My gut's important to me. And that's a lesson I learned from basically doing the deal with Kerry Packer, amongst many other lessons. But that one was an important one about myself. Cool answer. It's a very cool answer. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your time. That uh, concludes our interview. Obviously, if our listeners want to hear more from you, your podcasts are Straight Talk and The Mentor, yep. which you can find wherever you get your podcasts, which are two really good listens as well. I uh, often find myself tuning in. You've had some amazing guests on there. But, mate, I have thoroughly enjoyed this chat it's been a very different chat from our usual guests but in an enjoyable one most sincerely so thank you for joining us here on the buy round thanks legend cheers mate that mate that was class <laughs>